What's going on guys? Welcome to All Access Magic. My name is Ryan Edwards. This guy over here is Blaze Sarah. Welcome everybody to the show. This is going to be a fun one. I've been looking Nuts. forward to this for so long. I told Ryan I wasn't going to do an episode today. Yeah, and he did. And then he, he said, there's one guest and he's available on this particular day. And I said, okay, okay. All right, we'll do an episode. <laughs> I was like, you know what? If For this guy... For this guy, I will 100% do an episode on my birthday. Yeah. So I, I said, <clears throat> Blaze, it's your birthday. Suck it up. I'm going to get the best guest ever to come on, and it's going to be an epic episode. And so he's here. I've, he's I've here. declined two gigs for this. <laughs> <laughs> so we're hoping for the best episode of all time. Doing card tricks at a, at a birthday party on hey. your birthday is not a gig. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't a birthday party. No, <laughs> nobody's having a birthday party on my birthday. <laughs> it's not um, allowed. Well, tonight Please. is going to be epic. Um, yeah. I, I forgot. I got to send you a little message, a little preamp message for later on in the show. I'm going to send this to you right now, please, just so that you know, but I can't say it on air yet. Uh, but uh, Yo, I yeah. just I just pull up Instagram and Lonnie Dillon, incredible, oh, a great yeah. magician Lonnie's and magic awesome. historian. He posted just now three hours ago. Happy 11th birthday to our son, Blaze. I'm so proud of this kid. He's crazy <laughs> smart and so damn cool. I can't wait to see what he accomplishes in life. Yo, <laughs> I think I've found an arch nemesis. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Same That's awesome. birthday, but his All is right. Blaze with a, B, with a Z. I just sent you a message, secret message for okay. later on in the episode. But uh, All right. let's, uh, let's, let's bring him in. Let's, let's get this show started. Welcome, everybody, to the show. The long-awaited. Oh, I oh, I started. Okay. The long-awaited. The man. The myth. The legend. Homer. The man. The myth. The legend. Lee Wack. Welcome to the show. <laughs> He's like <laughs> the. Uh, hello. Oh, hold on. I was just recording that for my new yeah. uh, intro. That's yeah, it. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Move over, David. Homer is doing the show tonight. Yeah. Uh, he's, yeah, yes. he's got the best intro now. You know. Yeah, the Pacific Islander version. That's it. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> you know, David has the intro where he talks about winning so many Emmys and stuff, but it doesn't have the hype that that, that intro just did. Mm -mm, no. Or the volume. Yeah. It's a real that's... emotional roller coaster. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You've never had this amount of audio peaking in an intro before. Yeah, but that's that... what we bring to the. That's what we bring to the show. The best was last week uh, or a couple weeks ago. My wife, so my studio is up beside our bedroom, and so my wife is sleeping in the room next to us uh, already, and so she was not here. And I, we went all out. A couple of listeners were like, "Oh shit!" Like, <laughs> she just busted my eardrums. So. But uh, yeah, headphones warning <laughs> next time. <laughs> headphones warning next time. Yes. Uh, yeah. But uh, Homer, you know what's going to happen. Like at this point, you know what's going to happen. That's it. If you're a frequent watcher, you've seen it before. So Homer, how's things? You're uh... good. I'm just uh, just chilling in Las Vegas. It's a nice day. Really hot today and uh, not too windy, which is nice. You can get really windy here and uh, mm -hmm. happy to be on the show. So. Yeah. yeah, we are like a like Blaze said today's Blaze's birthday, uh, and he said to me like three months ago or something. He said, "I'm not doing an episode on my birthday," and I said, "I'm gonna make you do an episode." <laughs> and then when you said you could do I, tonight, I owe you a big one. I owe, I owe you something. So. No, you don't owe me. No, it was, it was when I saw. Oh, it's Homer Leewag. Okay, we're we're doing it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I owe so, you some uh, San Hubert or something. Yeah, <laughs> Wait, are you um, in Canada too? I'm not in Canada. No, I'm in oh, okay. Connecticut. Yeah, Connecticut right oh, now. Okay, um, so yeah. same thing. Yeah, basically same thing. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell people I'm from Connecticut, and they're like, "Oh, is that near like Toronto?" Yeah, know. yeah, exactly. Well, we That's did have boring. that mixed up. I I asked Blaze to do a gig for me in Buffalo. Uh, and he's right beside basically New York City. Right? I severely oh. miscalculated how far away Buffalo was. Yeah, uh, so he's like, oh, I could easily do the gig. It's like a two-hour train ride. 
<laughs> it's 11 hours. Yeah, New York so, State's a big state, right? Yeah. New York State yeah. is a much bigger state than I realized. <laughs> yeah. Because I, I perform in New York every weekend. Uh, so I take the train in all the time. I did not I did not realize that you could go another 10 hours in that direction. Yeah. And still yeah. be in New York. And still yeah. be in New York. Exactly. It's crazy. It's crazy. But. So, Homer, let me ask you this. For the people that maybe, I mean, if people don't know who you are, they're, you know, obviously living under a rock for the last, like, 20, 30 years. Uh, but, you know, we know you as the guy, uh, you know, you work for David Copperfield, uh, right? But what is your position with David? Because I, I've even had a couple of friends. I told that I said to them that you were coming on tonight. And I said, you know, he works with David and stuff. And they said, what does he do? And I said, that's a great question. <laughs> great question. And some of my closest friends still have no idea what I do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, and it changes daily. Uh, but my, my title is co-director, um, which is basically means what it says. It's just co-director. It's just a title. But um, in my mind, it means I'm responsible for um, everything that you experience in the show. So I'm... I keep an eye on everything from the music to the staging, to the lighting, to uh, the illusions, if there's problems with illusions. Um, and of course, you know, I work closely with Chris Kenner backstage and we were problem solvers. And, uh, and I also mm. have an art background, an industrial design background. Mm. So I do a lot of uh, design, designing and writing uh, and, and drawing and, Build uh, designing the illusions to be built. Uh, I work with a lot of staging uh, of the illusions. Um, yeah, exactly. Chris has no <laughs> idea. <Yeah. laughs> I told Chris to, per, I, to to talk to, to for this to be a normal conversation. Chris has to uh, to taunt me during this. Sure, Ben. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but yeah, it's it to me. It's whatever you know, makes David happy. Sometimes I'm working on something for the island. Sometimes he wants a PC music edited for the show. Sometimes yeah. or something in the show that's been bothering him. That, you know, an illusion could be in the show for 10 years and there might be a moment where he's like, well, this could be better if this happened and then I'll work mm. on that. I'll try to mm. figure that out. Whether it's a music thing, a staging thing, maybe there's a lighting thing that's been bothering him. He's just kind of been put on the back burner for a long time and I'll try to figure that out. It's just something in the script and I'll just go through the words and, you know, and it's based on feedback too. You know, someone might see the show and be like, well, it just seemed too confusing this plot point or whatever's going on in the story. And I'll look to the script and I'll try to consolidate or simplify or make things clearer. And that's basically it. I think it's just, I work on what you experience. That's important to me. Mm. I don't want you leaving the, the, the audience, the audience leaving disappointed or confused or frustrated i want you to have a, the most amazing experience possible so that's uh, mm. what i focus on nice wow nice. yeah and in order to do that in order to be able to be a creative problem solver where you can help with whatever different facet of the show or or other project that david's working on and whatever thing that needs to be solved in that moment you have to have that kind of varied skill set so i'm i'm interested in talking about your background and how you kind of acquired this specific set of skills that allows um, you to solve any problem necessary well, chris also says that sometimes he wants just lunch like yeah. i don't know yeah. if he means me or me lunch or you <laughs> yeah <It's> like, <laughs> yeah that's an interesting way yeah. to put it is it it's that like, sometimes david needs you to grab lunch or yeah, sometimes he's, you're hungry <laughs> yeah he's like homer's sometimes hungry but but david is too sometimes <laughs> yeah whatever it takes you know i'm here yeah. to please so. yeah but um yeah i have um a, you know the people that are very successful uh backstage working for us are not people that are normally specialized in one thing they're good at just kind of rolling with the ideas and working on whatever, you know, if we have to figure out a new software to work on something, we'll, you know, now, nowadays it's to, you know, YouTube, you go on YouTube and you learn how to do masking in, in premiere, or you want to figure out a Photoshop trick or an illustrator trick or an audio editing trick. I'm searching all the time on, you know, hype, you know, on stuff I'm working on. And it's, um, I think that's part of what why like Chris and I have been there for so long for decades is because mm -hmm. if there's a problem to solve, we will figure out what it takes to figure it out. I mean, yeah. one of our directors on our TV special once joked, uh, 
you know, David needed an, app an appendix removed. You know, Chris and Homer would go on the internet, figure it out, and get it done that <laughs> night. Nice. Um, so, yeah, we had uh, uh, Ryan, you know, Patrick, you know, yeah. he worked for us a little bit. He, he was one of those guys where we'd give him something to do, and he'd, if he had to learn the program in an hour, he'd figure it out and, yeah. uh, and do it. And I have a, an industrial design background, which is luckily a, a industrial design is like product design. Mm. It's, it's a multidisciplinary skill. So I knew how to draft, how to draw. I know how to, or used to know how to like mold and make things for manufacturing practical stuff. Uh, I kn knew uh, about color and composition and, uh, how to sell sell something or, or promote something. So industrial design taught me many skills, and that's why I have a little bit of graphics, a little bit of drawing. I can draft. I can translate an idea from my head or from David's head onto paper. Mm. So, and a lot of that comes from being an industrial designer. Mm. So that was like the main background that really helped you when it came to like being able to apply that skill to a lot of different, you know, wide array of things. Yeah, I think so. Also just being an only kid and dabbling in, you know, toys and, and having, I had a very, uh, I have a very artistic dad who is mm. an amazing artist. And I just kind of, you know, through osmosis have, uh, had a great eye for art and composition and detail. Uh, mm. a lot of that influences for my dad. So. Oh, nice. Now, wow. Here's a, here's a question for you. Cause I find it <clears throat> in magic all the time. Uh, at, cause I, I'm probably more like you Homer, where I do a lot of the artsy stuff and building things and, you know, making stuff all the time. Do you find like that's <laughs> a disadvantage in magic now? Cause I find a lot of magicians have no background in any of that stuff. And so don't know how to build things, don't know how to make things, don't know how to design anything. And so it's always just like, outreaching to other people and stuff. But I mean, obviously having you in house to be able to do that is, you know, well, so I'm, a, I'm in a very closed off world. I literally, I don't spend a lot of time with magicians or in the magic world. Mm. Um, but I've been very lucky enough to always, I've been surrounded by very creative people all my life in college. So my best friends were, you know, design cars for GM and, mm. and all, of, you know, and, you know, growing up with Chris Kenner, one of the most creative problem solvers I know, that was like, to me, it was normal to be around very creative people. And when we had Patrick Kuhn and, uh, you know, and and Blake Voigt, mm. just, I, I saw, you know, Blake Voigt wanted to study industrial design and he's amazing with crafts and paper and building things. So, yeah. and Kalen, I, I've just been lucky. I've been surrounded by people um, that, I, that have been creative. So that's all I know. Mm. I don't know. Yeah magicians that that can't cut foam core and build yeah. <laughs> so I've, been pretty, I've been lucky in that you know yeah that regard absolutely yeah nice yeah i like i said today like a lot of times it's you know someone will see something and it's like i've got to buy this gimmick because there's no way that i could make it myself and stuff right mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times i find like i'll see something and be like oh i could i could make that like instead of spending a crazy amount of money you know uh, there's a person that we both know that i've recently had this discussion with that it was like oh i uh i needed to track down the original creator of this thing because it's no longer on the market and it's like i needed to have him you know make these or find there's some stock and i was like it's a it's a flap dude like yeah yeah it's, it's just a flap it's yeah. a ball and tube yeah yeah, yeah exactly like, i'm sorry i meant ball and tube Ball yeah. Tube, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Bill and tube. Bill and tube. Yeah. It's a cooler version of Bill and tube. It's a new one. Yeah, like, you uh, ball up the bill, yeah. <laughs> and then you put it in the tube. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Yeah, I've, uh, I've been lucky because, like, even with uh, some of the people that we work with in the show, you know, we have a guy that can make anything electronically. If you need mm. to make a string pull, do this on a servo, on a solenoid, or whatever, he'll make something in an hour. Yeah, I yeah, and so I'm I do really remember lucky. I have an effect uh, that Kerry Pollock made, uh, and uh, became friends with Kerry, and he he sold one I guess to David. There's only like ten of these things in the world, um, and flying. Was, uh, no, it <laughs> yeah yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, watch as I start to fly now. <laughs> um, no, uh, and so I remember uh, Kerry saying to me that he brought it to David and you guys were like, this is a crazy, awesome effect, but I don't want it to run on a lithium battery. Like it has to run on a batteries that we can get from the gift shop. And so the electronics guy there and stuff, they said like within an hour or something had it all working on batteries that you could buy at the gift shop. Uh, yeah. It, yeah. A lot of our batteries are drill batteries, you know, a DeWalt drill battery yeah. that you can buy at the local Harbor store. That's the power. Some yeah. of our, our winches and things that need to spin really quickly are routers. One of the strongest motors you can buy is a, is a, a router from the hardware store yeah and you can put that on a uh, some kind of rheostat or something you have a variable reel that can literally yank cloth through a hole in the wall you know yeah you know, if, you, if you need that yeah yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah i've definitely used some uh drills and stuff in some television show stuff to, to pull things across the stage mm -hmm. and everything else is like we could just set up a drill and like a big spool on the end of it and go to town so yeah it's variable speed and it's cheap and um this is a great question i'm gonna blaze i'll i'm i'll i'm gonna cut you off uh, kind of because this question came up and homer i see you post about this stuff all the time so alex boyer uh who's a good friend of ours said uh where did your love for cooking come from also love the new hoodie uh <laughs> so we see you post uh, pasta photos like all the time uh and those aren't mine not yeah. mine. <laughs> no. <It's> no. <laughs> they look incredible i i oh that's I, the other homer yeah <laughs> oh shoot yeah ah. sorry um well cooking is to me is like mad uh, cooking like when you go get an amazing meal or yeah you eat something to me that's a magic trick because you're like mm. how is this possible of the same stuff you would get at a grocery store how is this mm. this amazing experience so to me, it was like figuring out a magic trick. So I started learning to cook all the things I loved. You know, my friend Chris Korn said, when you're in New York, go to Lupa, this little restaurant in Soho, and get the Bucatini al Matriciana. And I did that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wait, say that again three yeah, times. I, I, I said a long time. Yeah, I said a long time. Can you say it three Bucatini times? Bucatini yeah. al Matriciana. Okay, we lost you after Bucatini. Uh, <laughs> Bucatini al Matriciana. Bucatini al Matriciana. I'm so sorry, Daryl. Yeah, Bucatini. Hold on, there's a. There, I know an Italian guy right there. Oh, okay, he's yeah. going to correct my. Bucatini, no, no, Christian Sassano is on. He's going to correct my pronunciation nice. of Bucatini al Matriciana. Anyway, it's a uh, yeah, hollow. It's really the hand was was yeah, the missing hand. link in the pronunciation. Yeah. <laughs> it's a hollow noodle, and it's basically a tomato sauce with guanciale and and red onion with huh oh, spicy. <laughs> with <What>? huh? <laughs> you know, some guanciale of that. is pork gel, so it's pork cheek that's been uh, cured in like salt and pepper. Very simple. Okay. Easy. Very fl it's like bacon on crack. It's amazing. Pork gel. I mean, not the best hairstyling. Yeah. <laughs> but it works. He says that your Italian is great. Italian is great. <laughs> Lindsay um, says Booker T. <laughs> Booker, <laughs> Booker T. is gonna is gonna lay the smack down. <laughs> Chiano. Uh, but that dish is is an amazing dish, and that was the first dish I was like, okay, I'm gonna figure this out. I want to learn to make it as good as the restaurant. Yeah. And it's taken me about seven years to wow. learn that. And the reason why is because it looks so simple. You make it, you're kind of satisfied. You make, you kind of hit this plateau. Mm. And it's not until you realize the nuances of cooking, which I'm not a trained chef, so I'm learning all this mm. on the fly. Yeah. Of how to render that guanciale fat just perfectly, how to cut the onion the right size. If you could even cut the onion too small or too big, it changes consistency in the dish. You know, there's, oh. There it is. Look at that. Oh, that's mine. Oh, that's, I was like, that looks pretty good. That's my that's, photo. That's yours. Yeah. <laughs> that's your photo. <laughs> so that cutting board has a light on it specifically for food photos. Oh, wow. That is, that and, is it, and there's also, a, there's a secret trick there. there if you, you notice on that photo, it's not just white light. It's light that has a little bit of dappling shadow in it. <laughs> hey, Lindsay. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, seven years. That's dedication. That's how long I wait each week for the show to start. That's my fault. I had a little that's stomach crazy. issue. I was in the bathroom for thirty minutes before. I, <laughs> yeah. I was literally. I had the same thing. So yeah, we're like, all good. Well, like Homer I need to use the bathroom. I'll just have yeah. you play one of your jingles. So get yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it gives you lots of time. Yeah, yeah. That's why we made them longer so that uh, if we have to run to the bathroom. But I mean, look at these photos. Are amazing. Uh, makes me. It's also an exercise hungry. in food photography because food is really hard to take pictures of. So, but if mm. you get good lighting and see, the secret to that is this. It is Ooh, uh, look at that! Wow, so that I is... hold this up and it gives me a nice. It, it kind of breaks up the lighting, so it's you know. Like what is the through. what is the uh, purpose of that shape that's cut out in it? It's random, and I've had to cut. And modify it a little bit. I'm gonna do the whole thing like this. <laughs> you should. That's yeah. Cool. This is, yeah, it's that's, so much better. That's a good look. You know, yeah. I mean, your lighting uh, is great. The lighting <laughs> is incredible. Wow. <laughs> no, but that that helps dap. You know, when you're like in a park and the light streaming through like a a, a big tree and it's just that beautiful mm. dapple of light. That's what that gives a little bit of texture. I nice. probably overused it, but. Now, I think, Homer, after we're done the episode, I'm going to have to give you a call sometime to just help me with some office lighting stuff in here. Because yeah. <laughs> this is the best lighting I've seen in a long time, or at least today. Yeah, yeah, just today. <laughs> yeah, there we go. There we go. Uh, now we're on air. Yeah, <laughs> no, but, like and the show starts I call now. That, I, I call that like Kubrick blue. It's like in a lot of Kubrick movies, there's that blue, serious, deep blue light coming out of, you know, a little, mm. a little hyper- real come to the windows and like eyes wide mm. shut and uh yeah and the shining and stuff so but i like it yeah. i like to think of it as like uh you know michael jackson's moonwalker the uh the the film that he did i, where, I, I uh, haven't seen it i've not seen you that. haven't seen it so he actually what he did is during the bad era while he was filming all of the music videos for the bad album he took Smooth Criminal, and that itself is like its own nine, ten minute short film piece. But it's actually part of a 30 minute short film where he got Joe Pesci to act in it. And it's like a whole gangster film. Um, and then around that, he connected all of his other music videos and made like a, a visual album, oh, nice. like short film story. Um, and yeah, there's a, a whole part of it. I think it was Colin Chivers that's uh, that directed it. Uh, or Chivers, and it's uh, it's basically like a film noir, but they used a lot of blue light and shadows and things as the uh, as the cool. way to kind yeah, of do it, it cinematically. It's it's really well done. That would be hilarious if Michael has list. like a gangster movie, and then all of a sudden breaks out into his music videos. So it's like all of a sudden thriller is happening. <laughs> it's like, oh, well, dude, I mean that's like gangsters come out. It's like Tommy guns uh, with thriller yeah. going on. <laughs> But, I mean, uh, it's kind of like what happened. I mean, it's this weird plot about Joe Pesci, how he's trying to get kids to do drugs. And so he's like, <laughs> yeah, we're going to get kids to do drugs. And then Michael Jackson comes in to stop him. And then Smooth Criminal happens. <laughs> you know, and then and he, uh, Michael Jackson, to get away from the mobsters that are shooting at him with Joe Pesci, he morphs into a car. <laughs> and then oh, he wow. drives away as this like DeLorean. And then he morphs back into, yeah. It's yeah. crazy. It's a really was, uh, disjointed plot. I was back when it was cool. Yeah. Well, sometimes you yeah. got to string things along to make an act. I guess that was the that was the first video animation. They were like, "Well, what can we change you into? A car. All right, a car. let's do it." Yeah. So that was uh, pretty cool, though, back in the day. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I still remember watching his uh, music video. Uh, and actually, you mentioned working with Kale, and he was the one that showed it to me when Michael comes up on stage and the audience is just screaming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like live in Budapest? Um, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And yeah, then he ridiculous. moves. He just moves like yeah. this, and then they go nuts again. And yeah. he's it's like, incredible. Yeah. yeah. And he was always like, this is how magic should be. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, I don't think we've seen that level yet where someone moves pop out of the, you know, the ground in a civil pose. That's yeah, in a civil just, pose. <laughs> and just complete the packet. Yeah. <laughs> just going nuts. Chris, oh, if so Chris good. is still watching, maybe, maybe Chris. You can, Chris, you know, Chris, you gotta, we gotta get you to pop well, he can out break of a toaster. Dance, so he could do that. He could literally yeah. just. Oh, Chris can break shit. dance. Oh, he, Chris. He, yeah. He didn't tell us about that yeah. as a secret talent. I don't he, think. Did he? There's a tape somewhere of him on like Dance Fever or something. So. Oh, Homer, can you find that for us? I'm mm. I'm leaving it up to. All right, all right. <laughs> We're gonna, gonna. We are gonna find that. Um, it'll. If it wants to come out, it'll come out. Oh. He says, "I can do that." <laughs> yes, I can. <laughs> 
Chris, do you have the footage? Can we have it? <laughs> they're pop uh, and lock fighting. They're <laughs> they're, no, 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 they're breakdance fighting. Is that the line? From he says, good luck. <laughs> I'm right. trying to find this video, um, but it turns out that there is an African-American artist named Chris Kenner who's released yes. a bunch of dance songs. There's a song, <laughs> Land of a Thousand Dances. He has so it. He pops says, up every I do time. and no. No. <laughs> <laughs> We'll uh, find it. If it's we'll on the internet, it. don't worry, yeah. Chris. We'll find it. <laughs> We've got some pretty good uh, viewers that uh, mm. that will scour the internet for us. Uh, so I'm I'm curious, uh, Homer, like you were talking, you mentioned earlier, kind of being isolated from the magic community. Um, and, you know, the, you've put out projects to the magic community. You've been like steeped within it for a long time. What is your relationship with magic like now, like your personal relationship outside of working with David? Um. It's hard to say. It's like I love magic just because of just the enjoyment of wonder, I guess. Sounds cheesy, but it's true. You know, when I'm working for David, it's to me, it's not magic. I'm we're we're solving problems mm. with the result being something that's joyful for the audience. I don't work too much on my own magic. I have a few things here and there. I don't know if you saw me post like a thing with Baby Yoda a few times last mm -hmm. year. And then I, yeah. I just did something with a uh a picture on a wall uh, <clears throat> a few weeks ago. That's about all the magic I've really been working on. And um, But outside of the show, I just love seeing good magic. I love watching and being fooled and seeing, you know, all the kids these days just doing such amazing, innovative, innovative stuff and uh, mm. creating cool stuff. So yeah. I enjoy magic. I don't like delving in too deep. I like just being fooled and enjoying it. And not breaking it down and figuring it out and learning mm. the beats and yeah. I just 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 entertain me because I love that's why I love magic for. Do you ever show people magic in any kind of casual uh, very, context? Very random. It's just like today I was at an art store and when I handed the credit card to the guy, I you know it flew from one fingertip to the other and I caught it and handed it to him and I just ignored it like it was nothing. And this guy was like, do, 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 do you do things with cards? I'm like, no. This, the, 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 the card flew across. I'm like, it's just a magnetic stripe. It's very strong. And I just it's a magnetic go. stripe. That's it. I can't let it go. It's stuck. It's oh, great. Um, and then, you know, sometimes, like I said, I have that trick built into my one of my things on my wall now. I don't want to give it away in case you haven't seen the video. But... Um, if you look back in my reels a few weeks, there's a routine with a bulletin board full of objects. So oh, that's an example that of was, yeah, that's that something good. that I had in my house for years, and I was like, that'd be cool to do something with, and and then that routine sort of just slowly developed, and I made it happen. And you nice. know, that's about it, magic wise. I've got some uh, balsa wood, balsa wood chopsticks that. Chris gave me sitting in the kitchen for an occasional vanish. Nice. <laughs> some rubber <laughs> shrimp and some squeakies. And nice. <laughs> Always got to have some squeakies. Yeah. It's literally just like impulse, but I, you know, I don't do a show or anything, but yeah. Now, I, obviously you were a performer back in the day. So is there ever, I mean, obviously you're working for David and stuff. Uh, is there ever that want to, to do a show or is it, there's not not a passion there for that anymore. Like, um, I don't know. I if it the opportunity presented itself, I'd probably try to think of something. You know, um, but I'm just enjoying you know cooking and and other hobbies right now. And if I'm inspired to do something magically, I'll work on it for a little bit, like the Baby Yoda stuff and mm. uh, and the picture, but. Uh, if I had to do a show, I I I could probably string together some of my old stuff mm. into a little show. But um, you know, when it happens, it happens. I guess. Nice. Now, <clears throat> oh, go ahead, Blaze. I can see Blaze is on the tip. <laughs> oh yeah. Do you, well, do you? Um, I feel like those of us that perform professionally get a get a, an immense amount of satisfaction and fulfillment from performing do you find that the satisfaction that you get from performing 
um, magic is not as much as the satisfaction you get from creative problem solving and getting to just, uh, you know, just dive in creatively. Do you enjoy that more? It's probably two different, um, you know, it's, uh, it's like, uh, if performing is like an almost immediate gratification, mm -hmm. but you know, problem solving, sometimes it's, you know, working on things for th three years before mm -hmm. you get yeah. even realize there's satisfaction. Yeah. And then you look back and you're like, Oh, that's kind of cool. God, that took a long time to figure out. That yeah. went through 300 variations. It went from super complex back to like an early simple idea usually. Yeah. But sometimes you have to go through the all the – you have to go way past the solution to come back to it sometimes. Mm. Right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, like the feeling that you get from something working on something for years and finally making an idea a reality, like you can't really match that from – Yeah, it's a just different a satisfaction. satisfaction. Yeah, it's just different. Yeah. It, um, so I remember, <clears throat> cause I know you do a lot of the drawings and stuff when, when David is bringing a new illusion in. So I remember, uh, I'll spoil one thing for people, I guess, in the show, uh, is the spaceship, um, uh, which is, you know, crazy. Um, but I remember seeing a lot of your drawings and stuff that you were posting about that. Um, so how much of that, <laughs> like your actual physical drawings that you're doing really, uh, are they more used for like inspirational, like, or is it, you know, you are really drafting this out because this is like the blueprint of exactly how this is going to work. Um, it's both. Um, <clears throat> you know, at one point David said, I went up spaceship. So I, I have, you know, four large sheets of sketches trying, you know, doing like an industrial designer would mm -hmm. just brainstorming on paper, 20 different directions. And it came down to one little sketch about this big. And David says, I like that. So that was definitely an inspiration. It was just a little five minute sketch with pen, and a little bit of shading. It was probably this big. It was really small. And, um, you know, David said, I like that. So I took that and now I drew sort of a schematic kind of to, we didn't know the scale yet at the time, Yeah. but I then drew that as a drafting a front view, top view, side view. And that became sort of, I believe that's in the front of the theater and framed in a, I don't think anyone knows is even there. That drawing is framed <laughs> mm. at the, at the box office in front of the theater, just up on the shelf. And it's just kind of sitting there, but that's the sketch that, um, and then I took that sketch and I wanted to learn a uh, Corel draw Corel paint at the time. Cause I love the concept illustrators that do like star Wars and star Trek and all those. So, I was taking a tutorial from one of those concept artists. So, but instead of the ship they had there, I replaced it with my design of the ship. Mm -hmm. So that became my sketch, like a 3D sketch kind of set the tone of the colors and the lighting. And from there, we sent it over to a guy that could do CAD. Mm -hmm. So that could basically turn it into numbers. And that's usually the hardest part because Usually when you go to a hard drawing that's to scale and accurate, sometimes you lose the feeling that you had an initial sketch because lines are fuzzy. There's more imagination involved. So that's usually where it becomes tricky because then the CAD guy does it and you're like, oh, it doesn't feel that. That just feels too hard of an edge. That just feels mm. too mechanical. So then we go back and forth between me and the CAD guy until we have something that is buildable. And this 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 is not just spaceship. This is anything we do, um, even from just a box. The box can look different on a sketch, and as soon as it becomes hard lines and hard edges, it is now this this really dry looking thing that just <laughs> doesn't have any has no life to it. So yeah. So the hardest part is breathing life back into the real objects so that it fits the story, fits the purpose mm. properly. I think that was, that was, I took a lot of CAD stuff when I was in school and uh, that was my problem with it as well. Like I would rather sit down and draw something or design something and make it look really awesome. And then, like you said, when you're doing with CAD, everything is just straight lines and you know, it's very. Yeah. And I have to be careful when I draw too, because I have to be careful. I don't draw things that can't be built. You know, yeah. I have to draw things that are practical and, I, I consider, you know, the, the materials are going to be used, the manufacturing process, that's use, its durability, 
it's storage and then chris i have to go with chris hey will this fit backstage yeah will this fit in a road case will this fit through a you know into a european truck you know so i have to keep all that in consideration and you see david's like no 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 just think you know think big. <laughs> don't limit yourself yeah yeah so mm. i have to find that balance so there's a question is uh, roughly how big is david's backstage because he's got some pretty it's long not, it's not version. that big it's no. um it's it's all relative but you know, our most modern theaters, and Chris will, can back this up, most modern theaters are decent size. Mm -hmm. and, until you go to the older theaters, like the old opera houses and the places we used to play at and some of the college performing arts centers can be small backstage. They might have yeah. a nice house, a nice thrust, but the backstage area might not be mm -hmm. meant for a show that has lots of props that are on wheels and yes. have to roll around practically we don't have a lot of stuff in the air like a broadway show might um when we did broadway we were on a t stage half the size of what we have now but we had a two-week load in and we could coordinate certain mm -hmm. props going up in the air other ones going underneath it switching them out you know the line set if you looked up in our broadway show sets were you know half an inch from touching each other going up and down giant sets you know, we can't do that practically in a touring show. So, yeah, the MGM stage, especially coming back from the Cedars Palace stage in the early 2000s, mm. was kind of a shock because it was we had beach at the time, which was a giant swing arm oh, yeah. plus the car mm. plus 13. So we had a lot of footprint and it was very difficult to store stuff back there. But, you know, we make do and uh, there you go. Nice. Wow. wow. Now we had a question from Alex Boyer over here. Is it Boyer? Boyer? I think I remember him saying Boyer after we said Boyer. Boyer as because mm. he's French, yeah. um, but I call him Boyer because we got Alex Big Boy he's, he's in the boy. comments. Alex Big Boy says, <laughs> "What B. is the process, Alex B? <laughs> what is the process to create a story around an idea? Does the idea come before?" Um, that's all, David, because. Um, and it can be either. Sometimes he's inspired to like, a lot of times it comes from it. Sometimes it's retrofitted. He, he sees an idea, let's say just an illusion that does one thing and inspires him to go, that'd be a great fit in this story. And I've been thinking of this story for a long time. Um, so usually I would believe the story comes second, but occasionally, like in the show, the the father, his story with his father has had many iterations for decades. Mm. So he's had that story for a long time. And so he was able to fit that into the whole blue story. But yeah, he we've had that idea of him visit, you know, revisiting his father for decades. So mm. yeah, because uh, back in the day, I mean, he used to do even like McDonald's aces, right? Yeah, grandfather's oh, yeah, aces. Grandfather's yeah. aces and stuff, yeah. Uh, and uh, and now, obviously, talking to Blue and stuff and, you know, going back in times of like, it's definitely uh, a, a big change from back back in the day. Yeah. So, right. uh, so let me ask you this. Of all of the uh, illusions and, and projects that you've worked on, is there one that you're most proud of that you're like, this this is something maybe that you didn't think you could do and in the end it came to fruition um maybe the spaceship I, yeah. you know i that my first drawing for a spaceship happened it was like 2012 and at the time it looked like one of those things that could never happen it was just yeah this it at at many points in the creation of that even including when we even had a spaceship hmm. It was now what do we do with it <laughs> you know how, <laughs> yeah. how, you know we had a very very complicated way of making it appear mm. that was difficult to rehearse it took weeks of rehearsal to get it to a point where it was kind of possible and then wow. after months of that it was like this is this, this is never going to happen and then mm. chris and i basically got to the point where it's like Let's just try it like this, mm. you know, and if we do it well enough, it should be spectacular. But mm. we, because it's like um, doing an effect that 
you think is needs the sleeves rolled up. It needs a circle of spectators. It needs uh, three cameras showing every angle when all you're doing is vanishing a coin, you know, or making yeah. a coin appear. <laughs> Maybe you don't need all that to still get an impact out of it. Yeah. So, well, I mean, it is it is massive. Uh, and I remember I remember being at the show just before the spaceship started as well, because there was all the TVs and stuff mounted mm -hmm. up on the ceiling. Uh, and uh, talking to Chris, I think after the show or before the show, and I was like, what is all of this about? Like, I've never seen this in the theater before. And he's like, that is basically, you know, nuts. David loves to surround stuff. You know, you know, we vanish the airplane, circle of people, vanish the train, circle of people, makes a car appear, circle of people. Well, that is a circle mm. of TV. So you can do the <laughs> map. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. <laughs> and did you did you edit all of the footage that appears on those TV screens? Because uh, it's it's kind of a, a large portion of the show is the, you know part of the narrative is those different short yeah, films. I'll say that any, any yeah anything that's not live, I've shot and edited or at least edited, wow. if not wow. shot and edited. <laughs> wow! Wow! <laughs> so, but you know, without giving anything away. Without yeah, when you so when you said uh, when Chris and I said, why don't we just do that? Do you want to elaborate on that and uh, just <laughs> all is, of the details? What is that? <laughs> yeah, what is that is is the, <laughs> what that is is to to put it in terms that most magicians understand is, let's say you have an effect, and you want it to be perfect, but because you want it to be perfect you never put it in your show because, well, I don't have this done. I don't have this built. This is not quite ready. When, okay, what if I need to vanish a ring? Chris. <laughs> Chris so this is, literally, this is Chris's example. This is Chris's Chris, example. Chris doesn't know. So I think we so should yeah, definitely just tell us all the details. Tell everybody so, all the details. This is Chris's example. So I'm going to talk, this is speaking for Chris. If you wanted to vanish a ring and but, and you wanted the best method possible so the ring could appear in a, in a fruit cake on the other side of the stage. <laughs> ah. But you want this ultimate vanish, the vanish is surrounded by people and the vanish is in test conditions. And it's, you know, you pour concrete so you know it can't go down. You put a wall of glass <laughs> and it can't go sideways, but you never do it because you can't, you never get, can figure that out when you can just vanish the ring in a, ring box that you buy from any local magic dealer make it appear in the fruitcake just to see if the effect even works mm. because if the effect works then you know it's worth the van working on the vanish mm. yeah but so that's basically what we did was to just let's just get the spaceship out there you know initially chris like let's just open the curtain and fly it out there in full view no no appearance just <laughs> chris was like yeah. let's see what People, how are they going to go? Wow, are going to see like, oh, that's cool. We saw that at you know Cirque du Soleil, you know. Yeah. And then once we kind of got it flying, we were like, well, now let's make it appear. And then we went to a very, very simplified version of what we were originally going to do. Hmm. And within the year, we had a decent appearance. So, and I wow. think it's you know the highlight of the show. Nice. Yeah, absolutely. My well, it's certainly an, a really iconic moment of the show. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's all it took was just a ring box and a fruitcake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's what that was? In that order. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Man, that I'll... conveniently placed fruitcake I forgot on the other side of the stage. <laughs> it's, it's a fruitcake, a euphemism for Chris. Fruitcake to make Chris laugh. <laughs> fruitcake was for Chris, but it's because of... Uh, our early love for the Jerky Boys. If anyone's old uh, enough to know that, <laughs> the Jerky Boys, nice. We may have to play some Jerky Boys at the end of the show. Yeah. That's it. So, <clears throat> Homer, I mean, we know you pretty well now. I mean, I feel like we know you pretty well, but I feel like maybe, maybe we just don't know you good enough. What Audible yeah. books do I listen to? <laughs> uh, oh. There's a that time. Is that time. That's a, that's a good question. It's, uh, we're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> don't worry. About it. Don't worry so, about it. You're getting ladies, ahead of us. Lady, ladies and gentlemen watching, uh, you know, I Homer messaged me during the week and he goes, you know, do I need to know anything about the podcast? I said, absolutely not. You know, don't. No, you don't need to know anything. And he said, well, I'm halfway through Tom's episode right now. 
and uh, I was like, don't, don't watch Elaine, the end. Elaine, uh, it was, oh, it was Alan's, Alan's. Oh, oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, and he was Elaine's. like, last week, and we were like, don't watch yeah, the end. Don't watch the please. end. Please. Uh, you didn't, right? I didn't. I didn't. I, didn't. I oh, stopped okay. at about three quarters. Oh, okay, yeah, good. Because uh, we, we literally had a moment where we turned to the audience and we were like, hey, this is just for us. There's no yeah. way Homer's going to watch this. Yeah, we literally episode. said. I, if you didn't we tell like, me that, if I didn't ask, I would have kept watching because it was it was going to play the next time I got in the car. Yeah, and then and then he said he goes i've already watched a couple episodes so homer was doing his research i mean he told me today he's, he's been studying for like the last week setting everything up for the shoot today and stuff mm -hmm. so uh homer is well prepared for this but yeah um, we did get a comment from Lindsay earlier where Lindsay said, let me tell you, Homer, don't hire these two. They still have their old podcast name on their bumper graphics. Well, I'll have you know, Lindsay, you are 100% incorrect, and I see no evidence Wrong. of that because no it evidence. is time for 20 questions. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's that time. It's time for 20 questions. It's time for 20 questions. Yeah. It's time for 20 questions. It's time for 20 questions. Yeah. Put two minutes on the clock. My my favorite comment of the night so far is Tigger T says, "Don't steal Lindsay's line to Homer." <laughs> that's, that's two minutes on the clock, or is the jingle two minutes long? Is it... you, well, that oh. is that. That's just so Blaze can go to the bathroom. Really, <laughs> yeah. <it's laughs> just so I can go to the bathroom. All right, we are. We got two minutes on the clock. Tigger said, "Was it always red?" <laughs> always red it was always red it was always <laughs> red and look at that Lindsay. you see it says all access magic it's always said all access magic. what did it say what, before yeah. i don't i don't think it's i don't think anything, it's else, anything other than all else magic but nope people always think that it said something else I'm no, sure why. I see no evidence of that. So. Um, and we're gonna move on now so <laughs> so are you ready Homer yes I am so you obviously know the instructions in eight seconds seven Six, five, four, three, two, one. Favorite Spice Girl. Oh my God, you suck! I don't know the Spice Girls. Uh, the the blonde one. The square root of sixty four. Oh God, twelve. I don't. Uh, four. <laughs> how much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? All of it. What is the quadratic formula? Uh, half of the. Uh, Duplex formula. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, okay. We're just messing with you, Homer. We're just messing with you, Homer. Homer told us that he already planned out his 20 questions. <laughs> He's like, he goes, I don't want to say uh or um during the 20 questions. And, and I right, just did. So, so that's, that, see, yeah, that's, that, that's what would have happened. Though. Been yeah. just a bunch of Dude, <laughs> favorite Spice Girl was such a good one. I love checking the note and opening up the favorite Spice Girl. The one girl that was though. on AGT. Isn't that, wasn't that a Spice Girl? <laughs> yeah, the one Chai that was Spice. Chai Spice. <laughs> <laughs> there uh, should have been a chai spice that would have been great uh, uh, no, <laughs> Homer, as soon spice. as we got off this afternoon I said I called Blaze I said Homer is all good to go he's got all the lighting set up I said but he already wrote down the 20 questions and he's got it all like memorized or written down I said we gotta have some fun with him let's because <laughs> he's like yeah you got me good yeah, spice yeah. girls I'm like what the <laughs> I was like, should we just change the order of the questions in case he has it all written down? Yeah. Uh, I think I just saw I like, a bunch of anime. Is, isn't Spice Girls have a, like a, don't they have a cartoon drawing of them or something? I don't know. Maybe oh, I'm thinking of Gem or something. You're thinking of the Powerpuff Girls? Yeah, yeah the Powerpuff thank you. Girls. Yeah, that's what I'm <laughs> there you go. Um, oh my God. Uh, that's awesome. I was all prepared. I even had like, I was going to take a sip of coffee during the first question. So I'd be like, <laughs> yeah, just be back. so <laughs> prepared. <laughs> oh man. All right. All right. Let's go through the real 20 questions now that now that your Man. heart attack is done. Yeah. Um, this right, was yeah. this was literally Homer just now when when we asked favorite spice girl. <laughs> it was just <laughs> Yeah. Uh, it's just yeah. full on I failed geometry. I failed geometry. I'm a Rush yeah. fan, so I haven't heard any spice music. Oh, Rush <laughs> fan? Love Rush. Nice. Big Rush fan. Yeah. yeah. Um uh -huh. All right. That was that great. Was Thank you. That, that was, was that was I really well. Because you right. know what you said to me this afternoon. You said uh, 
you know, I, I know it's really great to be spontaneous with answers and stuff, but I just want to give like honest, good answers. I don't want to. I should have told you. I <laughs> yeah, yeah. We had someone, well, we had Ecat. Uh, Ekaterina did that. She studied mm -hmm. everything. Uh, mm -hmm. it, we used to do an IQ test on the show. And so she studied all the answers. And so we asked the first question and she was like, answered it. And so we're like, okay, maybe she's heard yeah. it before. And then the second one, she was like, um, well, she, she answered that one like super fast. Yeah. And then she got to like the qu third question. She was like, I think it's supposed to be. And we were like, yeah, supposed what, to be. Yeah. What do you mean? And she's like, no, oh, nothing, nothing. And we were like, did you watch the IQ test on a previous episode? <laughs> and so and she's like, uh, yeah, I, st I went through and studied all the answers. So well, I figured yeah. 20 questions is not really a quiz. It's more like, you know, honest answers. So I might as well yeah, just yeah. write It's, it's honest answers. Um, yeah. But quadratic formula x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a come on man this is yeah it's just right. it's just you, you know it's as that. simple as how much a woodchuck could chuck it's just you like know? bucatini <laughs> 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 oh, <laughs> exactly. homer if you make it through all 20 questions you, you're gonna owe us some bucatini if i don't it's very sad because i have rehearsed this okay ready <laughs> so you got nine seconds eight Seven, six, New York City. Eight, we should just, we should five, just ask the questions four, really slow. <laughs> three, two, one. Dream <clears throat> vacation destination. New York City. Biggest pet peeve. Um. Uh, what are you mis doing? <laughs> misspelled titles like "quick care" with two Ks. Uh, biggest mistake during a performance. I got lost on the way to a blue and gold banquet and lost out of twenty-five bucks. Oh, what always makes you laugh? Otto and George. Uh, secret talent. Gleeking. First time you ever saw a magic trick. A uh, family friend did a card trick for me. Uh, if you could have one superpower, what would it be? Making a perfect French omelette. Dream performance venue. Uh, Close-up magic at an Andrew Blake film shoot. Mm -hmm. Most cherished memory. Um, first day on the job with David at Caesar's Palace on stage eating a Caesar salad. Favorite food. Nice. Um, General Tso's Chicken from Shun Li Palace in the Upper East Side. <laughs> uh, favorite movie? <laughs> Empire Strikes Back. What's the worst job you ever had? Sonic Welder. Oh, oh what's uh, favorite magician? David Williamson. If you won the lottery, what's the first thing you'd buy? Uh, house big enough for a pool table and a table tennis table and four friends to play with. There you go. Mm. <laughs> uh, what's your most highly recommended magic product or book? Um, a magic puzzle from Jordan Gold and uh, Simon Cornell. If you could remake any movie and star in it, what would it be? Temple of Doom. Dr. Uh, Jones, no more parachute. <laughs> uh, would you rather feel like a potato or look like a potato? Uh, look like a potato. If you had one wish, what would you wish for? Uh, everyone to get along. Favorite toy growing up? Han Solo blaster made out of Legos. Favorite sports team? Um, Tiger Woods. <laughs> I love that. It's your favorite he's, sports team. He's a one man well, he team. team. He's a one man yeah. team. He's, he's, a, well, he's definitely a cat. team now. The he's got the, correct the answer was Tiger is. Woods and his caddy. Yeah, Tiger Woods and his caddy. Sorry, yeah. Homer, you only made it through Sorry, 19. Homer, you made it through 19. <laughs> no, that was a uh, that was great. Nice job on uh, rehearsing all of the answers. I did rehearse, so it's I you know it, it can't count in the in the roster, I guess, but. I want, our, I want a good answer. Yeah. <laughs> Lindsay said, have you guys ever thought about taking 20 question suggestions from the Patreon page? If so, I got a question above. Um, ah, yeah, we, yeah, we did ask uh, question... on the weekly patter to, uh, to throw up questions. So, so uh, we did get Lindsay's question in that was above. Uh, I got one more question. I'm interested in what you said earlier about learning skills from YouTube. Do you use books to learn new skills? What about audiobooks? <laughs> Um, I do uh, I listen to a lot of podcasts and video mm. podcasts and and audiobooks is a great way to go. <laughs> audiobooks are nice. a great way to go. Absolutely. Any particular audiobooks that you uh, are a big fan of or podcasts um, that you're a big fan of that yeah, you could maybe there's find there's on audiobook. Audible? Yeah, there's a great audiobook for um the story of my life, or story of your life by uh, mm. uh what's his name? Eric uh, the, it's the basis for the the movie Arrival, which is one of my favorite movies. He did an amazing uh, 
short story called the story of your life and it's uh that's the last fiction i've read so nice mm. uh is it eric <clears throat> carl no it's no. eric's uh, the story of your life i uh I'm afraid to touch. If I touch the computer, I'm going to completely. <laughs> It'll all go bad. Yeah, it's been great so far. We were having oh, some. Oh, Eric, uh, Eric Heiser. Heiser. Yeah, something like that. Yep. Heiser. Yeah. Heiserer. Yeah. It's Story fantastic. Of your life. It's, it's huh. kind of, it's kind of complicated, but you know, I'm not a good reader. I'm, I'm really good at reading, um, uh, how to instructional. I can go to the, you know, as a kid, I went through the Derek Dingle's complete works from front mm. to back, could do every trick, you know, for a while until I stopped performing. But yeah, that's the uh, mm. same. I'm not a, part of, yeah. not a big reader that way either. But um, yeah. Audible recommendation, um, which uh, I forget if it was Alan or Tom that said about uh, Darren Brown's boot camp for life. Oh, uh, yeah. He has another one that is only from Audible. Uh, which is Darren Brown's boot camp for the brain. Uh, ah. so I thought that was interesting. I'm going to start. Uh, I already picked it up, so I'm going to start reading it uh, or listening to it this week. So that's but, uh, uh, that's awesome. Yeah, Darren Brown's boot camp for the brain. So yeah, check that out over on Audible. And, it says uh, uh, how to make your brain work better. Uh, so mm. always always good, especially before a podcast. So especially I'm def before. I'm definitely someone that that learns a lot better. Like you know, through audiobooks. I mean, I, I can sit down with a book, but at the same time, I also get intimidated by the idea of just sitting down and reading a book when I could be like listening to an audiobook and doing something else. You know, right. that's like, oh, I could get my workout in and expand my brain. So that sounds like a good plan. So I've been much more in the audiobook camp a lot, uh, recently. So if you're interested in checking out some of these books, you can go to audibletrial.com slash magic scrolling down I below. I wish I could try it on Audible. You. Oh, I can. Oh, I can. <laughs> oh, I can. Oh, I can. <laughs> That's amazing. That's uh, great. So thank you, everybody. Uh, you get a free trial for Audible. Audible. It doesn't cost you anything and helps support the show. So uh, sign up and uh, get some free audiobooks. But uh, back to the show. Back to oh, yeah. Ted Chiang. That's <clears throat> the, uh, that's the uh, author of uh, Story of Your Life. Oh, story oh. of your life, Ted Chang. Okay, so yeah. not Eric. <laughs> I think that's the screenwriter. Oh, that's, the, okay. that's the guy that took it from the short story to the screenplay. Nice. Story no. of your life is a short story. It might be in a book that has other uh, another. Yeah, title. so it's part of uh, it's part of uh, the stories of your life and others by Ted uh -huh, Chang. There it is. So. Yeah, you can check it out. Fantastic. Is it on Audible? I will be, yes, it is on, on Audible. Audible. So I will be listening to that very soon. It's amazing, yeah. yeah and you can try tomorrow. it for $0. For $0. Pretty sweet. Canadian. $0 Canadian. 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 Zero yeah. dollars Canadian. That's like they're going to give you money to listen to the book in America. <laughs> in America. <laughs> it's like negative dollars in America. They just, want, they just want people in America to read more or listen to. to listen uh, that's to the American books. way is we'll just print more money and think yeah, about it later. Just pay you to, to listen yeah. to something. Um, so, Homer, let me ask you this, because I talked to Chris. I asked Chris about this when he came on the show, because uh, I know that Chris used to have this routine that he did during David's show. Uh, where he would walk, uh, walk the strip and do like this big loop and then make it back. Do yeah. you have anything like that that you do where you're like, if you're, if you have to be at the show where you're like, okay, I, I got to do this during the performance and stuff? No, usually I'm catching up because that's usually when I'm working the fastest. Cause when David, as soon as David comes back from the show, you know, comes back into magic lab, his first thing is what's new. You have something to show me. Mm -hmm. So that's usually when I'm like trying to get something to the point where I can show him. And I hate showing David unfinished stuff. So even mm -hmm. my rough drafts are very polished as much, mm -hmm. you know, even if it's like a rough edit, the dissolves have been figured out. There's a little bit of music. You know, I try to have nothing that takes you out of it. You might not be the mm -hmm. final edit, but at least it's it's as good as you know it's professional so yeah. and that usually means working a little harder and faster just that last 10 minutes of the show i'm like okay i finished this thing but 
is it, it what's he going to give a note on what's what's going to jump out at him and go well oh, that needs some work because i don't want to hear that i want to see like no no notes <laughs> and that's like the greatest yeah. thing you can hear is on the notes uh, well, why don't you try this but that's great you know mm -hmm. so Absolutely. yeah during the yeah. show you know maybe the first 10 15 minutes i'll have my soup and kind of just think of stuff but the, the last half of the show is like <laughs> can I get done? Soup is a very <laughs> integral part of the creative process. That's Absolutely. It, it is. Yeah. Yes. Just <laughs> slurp it. You, you know, yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to say that that's one of these. Uh, let me see if I can find <laughs> I can't even find it. It's right you're... at the bottom. It's right at the bottom. That's a, a gold nugget mic drop right that's there. That's a gold nugget mic drop. To be super creative and get problem solving done, guys, you need to have soup. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Got to have your soup. You Got to uh, have your soup. An integral uh, part. Um, so soup that's, is good that's food. A, yeah, I know that David is a perfectionist, uh, and uh, you know I know that he's like very meticulous on things. Do you guys do you ever butt heads that way where you're like, no, this is perfect, and David pushes you to to yeah, go further all the time, um, all the time. There's been at least a hundred, I don't know what the numbers, dozens of times where I'm like, there's no way this can get any better. This is so good. And he's, you know, he's the guy that's out on stage that can feel the audience. He can really feel an audience like you're starting to do this and like looking at their watch. You know, it's not that exaggerated, but mm -hmm. he can feel that as a performer. I'm not on stage performing, so mm -hmm. I can't feel the energy. So I've learned over the years to kind of trust that when he says, you know, this thing's not working. How can we make it better? Even though in my head I'm going, well, I've done everything I can. Hmm. that's when I go, all right, let's look at it. Let me watch some tapes. Let me watch it live. Let me videotape it on my phone and watch it. And, and I can pretty much say every single time he's been correct. We, there's been a way to make it better. As much as I inside, you know, originally <laughs> I used to fight it. I used to be like, ah, why are we doing this? This is a waste of time. Yeah. Let's go do the other three projects we're working on. Why are we focusing on this? It's because he's out there and he feels it. it's not right. I've learned just in the last couple years, three years, you don't include the pandemic here, that to trust his instinct mm -hmm. because he's going, he's not just saying that because he just wants busy work. He's feeling something that's mm -hmm. not right. And that's where I'm learned to trust him. And I think, you know, as magicians out there, if something doesn't feel right, even if your friends are saying, oh, it's great, it's the best thing I've ever seen, you know, your friends will tell you that. But if your gut is like, there's something wrong, you know, work it out, watch a tape, ask yeah. someone that's not your friend for a real opinion. And and you'll find that a lot of times uh, there's something you could have done better or improve mm. something you're doing, so. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. That's a that's a that was the real gold nugget right there. Yeah. <laughs> that was the actual mic drop moment. Yeah, soup is probably not the gold nugget, but I mean, uh, I think that there, it was a close important. second. You know, yeah. how many golden nuggets do you drop? Uh, that's a personal question. It depends yeah. on how many times soup comes up in the conversation. Yeah, really. I mean, if we have some more soup, then then it yeah. may then it may yeah. drop more. Um, yeah. So. Uh, Homer, do you guys ever, like, I know when I started performing, you know, on stage years and years and years ago after a show, I would always ask people like, what was your favorite part of the show? Or what, what did you hate? Like, is there something that you didn't like? Does that happen often with David's show now? Because you, I mean, you guys have it pretty dialed in or is it more like you're just watching for audience members, like after the show chat chatting and stuff like that? Um, a lot of times I'm working on the latest thing, so I'm not, you know, usually David has to bring it up to me or, you know, Chris will say, hey, I was out there and, you know, this just doesn't feel right. What can we do? Yeah. And, uh, uh, but, you know, a lot of times when David has something new in the show or he'll, he'll just, you know, during the meet and greets, he'll just ask them, you know, what did you think? Give me the real, give me an honest answer. You know, mm -hmm. you know what's your favorite or what's your favorite thing in the show? Well, I gotta. I'm gonna tell you something off camera that I told Chris last time, and Chris, mm. and Chris said to me uh, that no one has ever told him that, no one's ever noticed it, and it's something that dr drove me absolutely crazy. Yeah. Um. But uh, 
I know Chris said, I'm driving to the MGM right now. I'm going to tell David. <laughs> and so yeah. it, uh, so I want to get your take on it, but we'll do it off camera because sure. uh, uh, just yeah. there's a certain continuity thing. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, but it's, I loved it. Uh, like it was, it's, uh, yeah. Like something you liked? Uh, it was, uh, it was, it was a discrepancy. Yeah. A discrepancy that I saw and I was like, whoa, why didn't anybody catch this? Um, did we fix, said, did we fix it? Or I, I something don't know. that's just like it's, something uh, you can't do. No, do I, no, I think it, I think it, it could happen. It could be dealt with, but, but it's something that I thought was just, it's to me was humorous almost because, uh, just knowing the history of David and stuff. So, but, uh, but I'll, I'll bring it up after. So right. <laughs> it, yeah. uh, just see, maybe you get, maybe, maybe you fixed it. I don't know. That would uh, be, that would be cool too. I just remember when we were doing, like you said, McDonald's Ace's grandpa's car, yeah. you know, we used to put it on the screen so you could see David doing the sleight of hand. Yeah. And I remember, I believe it was Richard Kaufman. That was like, uh, you know, this, or was it Richard? Yeah. He didn't believe that was live. Oh really? Uh, and was, yeah. I mean, we've had people uh, say, "Well, the shirt, the shirt, the shirt cuff didn't match, so it's obviously not live." <laughs> <laughs> and I believe uh, Chris will verify this. We were performing in D.C. and Richard Coffin was in the audience. And at the end of the trick, David does the last, produces the last ace, and then he goes like this, and the camera pans up to David slowly to his face. And David walks down the stairs and puts Richard Coffin on the shot. <laughs> nice. So uh, tell me if I'm wrong. I might be wrong, but I believe that's the story. So Ooh, that's awesome. Now, oh, go ahead, please. Oh well, you mentioned uh, you mentioned the idea of Magic Lab. You know that like after the show, David's coming into the Magic Lab, and uh, I feel like that is kind of a topic that we didn't necessarily hit on, and is kind of fascinating. The idea of you know wh what is the Magic Lab like? You know, is it is it you and Chris and David? Uh, you know, and is that a, you know a creative environment where you're just bouncing ideas and, and developing things? Is it a workshop where you can actually physically construct these these things that you're working on? Like what what is the Magic Magic Lab and uh, and what is it like working there? It's pretty much all of that. It's a small room. It's not. It's basically was a dressing room, but it has uh, my workspace and Chris's workspace and then another table. But it's not a big space, so and it can get very congested in there very quickly. So hmm. every week, Chris and I are like, "Does this have to be here?" It's been sitting here for <laughs> two months. Yeah. Um, but it's, you know, I have hmm. my workstation, a couple dual monitors and some speakers, and, I, and I, I got a table that I can draw on or cut on. I got a side hmm. table. Chris has a desk. Um, it's basically me and Chris and David. We also have, you know, if people need to come in and work with uh, – are there any Oompa Loompas? I'm right here. Um, <laughs> He's the head Oompa. But it's basically me and Chris figuring stuff out, and I'm usually designing, uh, designing and building foam core mockups and scale drawings and or editing music or whatever it is, making a mess. Wow. Nice. Just make it a mess. Wow. Yeah. And well, like, the thing is, we jump yeah. around a lot. The thing is, we yeah. jump around a lot. So we'll work on something. We'll get to a point, and David will be like. Let's 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 work on this. And all of a sudden, I have this giant mock-up. Um, let me push it over here. At one point, I put it on some C stands and put it <laughs> way above me, so it was above my head. It was or sitting on the bar. So a lot of stuff gets tetris around just to make workspace. So wow, it's, like a giraffe. It's a well, it's because <laughs> like it's not really a shop. It's a it's a it's a it's a dressing room. So it's. Mm. It's not really a shop. If we make a mess in there, it's it's we have to clean it up ourselves. It's not a there's no equipment in there other than our own personal, you know, cutting tools and, and measuring devices. So Yeah. And you mentioned like, you know, that David will get off stage from the show, head back to the magic lab and then be like, oh, what do you have for me? Um, yeah. And considering he's doing how many shows a week? Is it 15? 15, 15, 15, 15 shows, shows a week. Yeah. Three on Saturday and uh, during Saturday. holidays and That's big, bonkers. big rush holidays we'll do three a day and do up to 25 shows a week oh my it's god crazy. okay so, like, so then like, how yeah. many of those did, like what, ces convention week like when when there's like a million people in town is that when you guys would uh not always because a lot of times when there's like ces those people are going to their convention and then they're going up to after parties and mm. corporate bought things mm. in strip clubs after the show they're not they're not <laughs> coming to our show so mm. 
So what? How many days a week is it? Because he's doing shows every night. So I, yes. I is it that every show after the show he's coming in and he's going, "What do you have yeah. for me?" Or is yeah, it before really? and after every show he comes to our magic lab, sees what's going on. Here's the notes. Here's what we need to work on. This is the stuff. Oh, this came wow. in today. Oh, did that, did you fix that thing in the show? To all to the team. This is not just me. It's Chris. It's our stage managers. It's our 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 crew. Um, and then he does the show, and then after the show, he comes right in, has soup. <laughs> while he works, I'm showing him what I've worked on. Chris is showing him what he's worked on, and um, if there's no other big things, he'll go take a nap before the next show, which is only going to be 30 minutes later. Yeah. Um, or if we're really crunching on something, he'll stay with us and 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 work out stuff with us because he's very hands on. So. Wow. Okay. Every single show he's doing 15 a Very week. And after, Unless, after every yeah. show, he'll be there yeah. hands on constantly making changes, adjustments, tweaks. Yeah. And during the show, uh, most of you know this, you know, when his mic is not live to the audience, he can mm. talk to the crew and us. We have speakers backstage where he can give us notes, entire list of stuff to do. He can, you know, tell the stage manager, this thing is, you know, this tape is peeling up on the stage. Let's fix this because it looks bad. You can say this string has been stick, you know, been being pulled late every show. Let's fix this. He can say, oh, uh, you know, I don't know. Whatever he wants, he can tell us during the show too. So, yeah, here's my favorite part of the show. Uh, like a thing that probably, I guess, probably a lot of people don't know is that David, for part of the show, wears slippers. Uh, and uh, at least he used to. Um, used to, yeah. Uh, so he would have his slippers set right at the front of the stage. Uh, and so the one time I was sitting there, uh, like right in the front seat by the stage, <laughs> and Pete McKinnon was like, "You." Uh, he messaged me and he goes like, oh, is, does David have his slippers there? He's like, you should reach on stage and take David's slippers. <laughs> and replace them with bunny slippers. Yeah, I did oh, not right. do it, but amazing. it would have been it would have been amazing. That would have been amazing. Yeah, he used to when he, we used to do squeeze box, which was the, the, you know, the yeah. shrinking Andre Cole shrinking thing. Yeah. You know, he'd be in a sock, so he'd pop out and the shoes, his normal Varvado shoes, take a shoehorn to put on. So he couldn't put those on gracefully after the trick. So he would just go on some slippers so he can do his next intro. Then when he walked off stage, it was usually it was right before blue, so he could walk off stage during the blue. There's a little intro, and that gives intro, him a yeah. chance to put this, the proper shoes on, and mm. you know, nice. Um, I know we asked uh, Chris what uh, what the biggest mistake has been on stage. So let's see if uh, let's see if you guys compare. What do you think has been the? Uh, the um, I forgot what. Oh, he talked about the vertical sawing. And the uh, and the throwing up, yeah. 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 I wasn't there for that, but yeah, it's I would have been crazy to be there for that. <laughs> um, I remember we were in London or in England somewhere, and in front of Prince's Die, I remember flying wow. had a hiccup where oh. we had to close the curtain, reset, and David they handed David or they turned David's mic on and said, You know, we'd love to make sure that you experience this the way it should be seen, so please give us a couple minutes. And we reset and we started from the beginning. Or, or I, I would have just <laughs> lifted David higher than the stage and been like, and he's flown yes. away. <laughs> ever have, <laughs> ever have dreams you could hover? I do yeah. all the time. <laughs> 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 oh, that's awesome. That's a pretty so good one. That's the one I remember. Inside. And uh, most recently we had a technical problem with Blue where Blue was just gonna, not going to happen. Mm. And it was so bad we actually had to cancel the show. That was I, a I very was rare, very like, rare cancellation of the show. Yeah, it's like uh, a twenty-minute portion. Yeah, of it's the a show. chunk. It, uh, yeah, yeah, it's like it's like taking a Michael Bay movie and saying there'll be no explosion tonight. Well, there's mm -hmm. nothing left. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's nothing left. <laughs> well, because that's something like you know, I know with mentalism, you know, it's always the debate in mentalism whether to use electronics or not. Right, because electronics will always at some point fail, and so you always have to have a backup. Now, something like blue is there. There's no backup for that, right? I mean, you might have another blue. We but... we we have some backups. And Chris and I, I was telling Chris, we have to have this. I'm not going to say what it is right now, but yeah, it'll you have heavily finger. involve Chris. <laughs> but I said. This is the backup. We should at least practice it once. Please mm -hmm. tell me that Chris is going to dress up as blue. 
<laughs> oh, that would be amazing. Just have Chris come out. <laughs> Chris is just there. Hey, what's going on? Yeah. Hi, David. He comes out on his knees like dwarf. Yeah. yeah exactly. I think David and I will be laughing so hard. Yeah. yeah he's got his shoes tied around his knees. Like when he did that as a kid. You remember dwarf on golf? You remember dwarf? I don't remember dwarf. It was. It was um, look that one up. not Harvey Corman. Who, uh, Tim Conway had the character where he that he would be on his knees and look like a, a short person. And it had a whole series of videos that you could buy on TV called Dorf on golf. That's and, you know, awesome. Dorf goes to the mall and it's just, they just, it was, it's, uh, you know, let's check good. out, let's check out the Dorf on golf <laughs> trailer. Oh no. <laughs> oh no, don't. No, go ahead. It's, it's, okay. It's We're going to get copyright strike anyway. We'll get copyright strike for it. We'll get like copyright strike. So I'll, uh, I'll just. Even something that old? We'll watch. Uh, I mean, it's on YouTube. YouTube. 30, at least 30 years old. YouTube's pretty hardcore now. YouTube's pretty hardcore. Well, don't risk it. Copyright strike. Nah, it's fine. We'll risk it. Okay. Let's take a look at Dorf on Golf. For a quick that. jolt of comedy, <laughs> get Tim Conway's <laughs> new video, Dorf on Golf. Now I'm going to just talk a little bit so that we uh, don't get <laughs> <covered> striked. <laughs> and... Extraordinaire. Conway shows his form. Oh, I think I blew a tube on this. And shows you how his caddy, Leonard, improves his game. I mean, that's a magic trick in itself. That looks it great. I mean, looks really good. considering where they are, I mean, considering that... what, they're in the yeah. middle of the green. That's not an, obviously just a raised platform. They yeah. had to literally dig a hole and yeah. make that look good. That looks decent. That looks really good. Uh, yeah, the side view there looked, <laughs> looked pretty great. Right. Oh, looked really good. Yeah. yeah. Good and, and especially when he kicks back onto his heels and totally falls, and you're like, yeah. oh. yep. it's like it wasn't, you know, the ground didn't do this, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Homer, did you work on that show? No. No. <laughs> Dwarf? No. Yeah. <laughs> I've got all the CAD drawings for yeah. that. He's, he's just pushing his other projects. He's like, uh, you guys should watch Dwarf. <laughs> it's 30 years old, but we need it's YouTube views. Old, but <laughs> coming out next There's week with Dwarf Royal 1 and Dwarf 2. <laughs> Dwarf 1 and Dwarf 2, exactly. Hmm. Uh, um, yeah. I don't have a question after Dwarf because that, that was great. <laughs> It's like, <laughs> that was the uh, derailment of uh, <laughs> yeah, that was a total derailment from cr super creative talk to uh, yeah. dwarf on golf. Yeah, but, it's, it's, but that it's okay. I do think that's a really, I mean, a fiddling Johnny said it in the comments. I think that's a really inspiring thing to have that level of work ethic. That David is such a perfectionist that it's constantly, you know, he's constantly developing things. And so that that's an interesting uh, thing. Is is he constantly? developing a lot of new things that are going to come and change in the show because yes. you'll, you'll see that there are things like blue that become a mainstay and are there for like a decade you know and then it's like you know he has some things like the car appearance that have been there like how long has he been doing that like uh since like 2001 wow yeah yeah so over 2000 ish two yeah and so even in a show where you have some bits that have become mainstays for two decades, he's constantly iterating and making yeah. changes. And so that's what keeps him going is just uh, working on new stuff and not just new stuff, but having good meaning to stuff, you know, all his, uh, all everything we're working on has meaning behind it. It's not just mm -hmm. because the magic is amazing. It's because he wants to have a strong message and leave an impact for for his for history's sake, literally. So, yeah. and that's what kind of makes things difficult. We're not just rushing to put in the latest, you know, illusion in because it's because it looks good. We want to have a strong message, and how can we do it? And especially in these days, with you know everything on the internet being exposed, and and a lot of people doing the same thing. We're trying to do things that are very unique and. Uh, push literally push magic forward you know mm. yeah so like let's say the 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 next big thing that's coming into the show how long have you been working on it and when do you think that it'll finally be in the show the last thing we're working on is, everything i'm working on now has been from one to two years of working one to three years i've been working on but I don't see them, even if they were like completely drawn up and ready to build, they couldn't be in, in, in at least six months minimum before 
for doing any of these things, if not longer. <clears throat> wow. wow. Now, I know that, uh, you know, guys like Penn and Teller, they're changing the show all the time. So they, they always say that every night could be different. Uh, but I know David is very structured in the show. Yeah. Um, you guys ever change things up, like just for fun? Like, is David ever like, we should bring this back to see, you know, uh, the reaction? No, no, not really. It's he's he's more focused on making sure the show's running well, and anything we can improve, of course, we'll work on it. But yeah. he's his mind is on the future, what you're going to see in the following years. So nice. Yeah, uh, and then going back on Penn and Teller, I mean. Here's a question, because I know every time I go to Vegas, I always ask, you know, the Uber driver from the airport or whatever, what's your favorite show in Vegas? Have you seen all the other magic shows in Vegas? Uh, and if so, um, what is your favorite one other than other than David? Um, I have I've I, it's been many years. I think the last show I saw might have been I saw Matt Franco's show a few years ago, but we might be talking well, maybe three years ago, I saw Matt Franco, and that was a great show. I saw uh, Xavier Mortimer um, mm. a few years ago. And it was fantastic. Um, it's been a while since I've seen Mac's show. I would love to see it at the Excalibur now. He's changed mm -hmm. venues, and I love always love seeing Mac. Um, I can't remember. Is that what other Magic shows are there? Uh, have, you seen, <laughs> uh, have you seen Shannon Collins' show? Oh yeah, I saw uh, Shannon Collins' show just uh, a few months just ago. Last week, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're, I, I forgot. You, for some reason, I don't. I saw that last week. <laughs> for some reason, I'm not thinking magic. I'm thinking because it's 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 mentalism and it's uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, I mean, Banachek's got his new show there. Yeah. Uh, oh, I did see that too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Vinny uh, Grosso, I've seen. I saw his nice. show too. Yeah. So yeah, I guess I've seen a, a few shows. Nice. Um, now, is there any shows other than magic shows that um, that David and yourself and, and Chris have been uh, inspired or influenced by? Because, I mean, uh, Vegas has some of the, the best shows on earth, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I know one of my favorite shows is, uh, I don't know David and Chris particularly, but I know one of my favorite shows is Beatles Love hmm. is, is a fantastic show. I love, um, uh, what's the... Absent is one of my favorite shows. If, oh, if someone, sure. when, when my friends come to Vegas and they want to see a show, I send them to Absent. Yeah, because yeah. it'll just kind of blow their mind of any expectation they would have in a show. Yeah, so I, I send them to I, Absent. I still haven't seen it. I've got some friends in the show, but uh, like a few friends, and I've never seen it. But I do the same thing. People are always like, "Hey, I'm going to Vegas. What should I see?" I say Absent because yeah. everybody I know says Absent. Uh, Absence so, is hilarious, yeah, and yeah, extraordinary, yeah. very inspiring, and yeah. crazy. I yeah. agree. And then, I, and Beatles Love is, I think, one of the, one of my favorite Cirque shows because it's just the music's so good, and everyone loves the music, and the way they interpret it with the uh, Cirque show is fantastic. So, mm. yeah, awesome. Wow, nice. Um, we have a couple more segments planned, um, but I don't want to go into them yet. We're going to wait a few minutes anyways, but because I know, Homer, you know what all the segments are, so we've tried to change them all up since oh, this no. afternoon. Uh, Blaze was working on a new jingle this afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, it's tu tipo favorito de burrito. <laughs> That rhymes so much better than the one you did today. <laughs> yeah, no. I've been thinking about it, that it all was, afternoon. Dude, the way to make it rhyme was to go into Spanish. It, it was Spanish. Not, yeah. It was not. I mean, I had what's. <laughs> uh, he, uh, he like what? What's your tastiest? Yeah, I was like, I was like what? <laughs> what's your favorite tasty kind of pastry? <laughs> It was really not working. Yeah, it was it was hard to to replace uh, our theme songs, but we had a couple of questions come in, so let's hit those up yeah. first. Uh, Bill, and, Bill and Johnny says, "Can you share a little bit about your photography work?" What do you want to know? That's a great question. Um, I mean, what inspire? I mean, we've talked about your food photography, uh, but what inspires you in photography? Um. That's a good question. I don't know. I just know I've been inspired when I, you know, again, turns into like cooking. It's like cooking. It's when you see a good photograph, it's like a magic trick. It's like, how did you capture that light? How does that expose? 
how is that possible that that was captured in camera? And so it's fun. You know, it was frustrating. I took, I had a digital camera back in, you know, early uh, 2000s and I couldn't take a good picture with it. Mm-hmm. And I put it away. I put it away for years. And it wasn't until I picked up an old film camera um, that I learned, oh, I don't need a set of lights. I, the sun's right there bouncing off this building in a cool way. Mm. And if I properly expose it with a, on film and I was, and I didn't have the luxury of seeing a, a monitor on the back. So I would take the film, I'd take a roll of film, get it developed. And I come back and I'm going, holy shit, that's kind of cool. And I got back into photography that way. And I started really paying attention to light and lighting and, you know, and I tried very hard not to, you know, when you just like magic and, and anything you get into, you kind of copy the people you idolize for a while. But I feel like, I don't know if I'm starting to have my own style. I don't know. People say I have a style. I don't know what that is, but I try not to copy people. I, I try to be inspired by other mm. photographers, but if I try to copy them, it just doesn't feel right. It's like, that looks like I just, I might as well have that person take that picture. So I'm trying to take pictures that make that challenge me and make me love the way light falls on an object. And I don't know, it's getting a little poetic, but I I just love lighting. So, and photography is about capturing that moment and that light just, you know, to your liking. So to your personal liking, it doesn't have to be appealing to anyone else, but yourself. So hmm. it's, it's a very, I, I get a very strong sense listening to you speak that it, you've, you have this kind of intuitive sense of this balance of like the head and the heart of like ha- being able to have certain things that are just like beautiful and indescribable of like, Oh, that's so fascinating how that's hitting. And like, I'm going to just cut up this foam board with a bunch of different shapes and stuff because it makes things like look right. And it just feels right. And there's not a technical aspect to it. But then at the same time, you're also doing like proper industrial design and like being able to bring ideas into a reality. And the creative problem solving part is a lot of like, technical you know needing to know your craft yeah i'm I'm nerdy like that i like the details and the geekiness of any subject Mm. but i also just like to enjoy it so like when i play billiards i've studied and practiced every kind of spin and deflection and angle but if i'm not having fun and just playing then i'm too much in the technical and not enjoying myself so Mm. i mean just i feel like just recently in photography, especially that I've stopped copying people and just like, this is what makes me happy. Mm. I'm not trying to make a photograph that's going to please seven different people. Cause then you gotta, you end up with mud, you know, you end up with something that doesn't have a voice. So hopefully my goal is to take photos that, you know, speak to me and, and I, and telegraph what I'm feeling to others. So, Whenever I take a photograph, the most important thing for me is that it represents how I felt when I witnessed it, that picture Mm -hmm. or created that photo. So even if, so if it means taking the photo and making it more blue or making it more contrasty, that's all is a reflection of what I had in my head, the the feeling and emotion and how I'm trying to communicate it to communicate that to you. So it's not because it's a cool filter or it's because it looks cool. It's this, this is how I felt when I took this picture. Is Mm. is it dark and blurry? Is it warm and bright? Is it out of focus? Is it dark? Is it busy? Is it simple? So do you find that the geeking out and, and knowing knowing your craft really well, like the deeper you dive into the technical side, does that allow you to unlock you know more of the fun and enjoyment and yes. like you know the heart part of it I'm a, I'm a firm believer of that it's like when i you know neil Peart, the, the the drummer for rush it's like oh, he has a- so much amazing technical ability that he can be free yeah. and experiment and be expressive if you have a limited tool if you have a limited tool set and this works you know it goes for magic or anything then you will end up doing this eventually you'll end up doing the same thing over and over again. Mm-hmm. You'll start repeating because that's your limited tool set. It might have great feeling, great expression, but if you really want to, if you, 
if you really want to really express yourself, I believe having more tools in the toolbox gives you more yeah. means for expression, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, like paintbrushes. You have yeah, brushes, so then you can. But it can also be very limiting. If you have a hundred colors to choose from, it can be extremely l limiting too, because sometimes having just a pencil and a piece of paper, having limitations can really force you to be creative with, with, mm. with having limitations. So there's a balance in that. Yeah, absolutely. Mm, it's like it again. Gold nugget again. Boom. <laughs> no soup here. I don't know why that gold nugget just looks like it makes me hungry. It looks like a, you know, <laughs> cheese. looks like cheese and popcorn. I uh, thought it was like a movie, like a, it was like a movie promo. It's like you know, it. free popcorn. If you're hungry now, you'll be so hungry later. Yeah, you'll just get hungry as the episode goes. That's that's all about soup. Yeah. And then we have gold. We're like a red lobster food. commercial. Our show. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, don't they have the best food photography? Red lobster. Oh yeah. Don't they? Oh my gosh. <laughs> all you need is a cheese cheesy bun, and then you're that's oh, it. Yeah. Squirt but, and butter. <laughs> um, what, what is an example of that? Uh, like Lindsay's just saying yes, and I've totally felt that you know the idea that limitation creates creativity. Like in the in my lecture, I talked about that. Like the first step, step zero of this six, six step process was that you have to create a scenario. You have to define and limit what your focus is because if you have just infinite possibilities, it's it's like where yeah. where do you go? There's yeah, any yeah. Amount it's of like ways. also having a deadline. If you don't put a deadline on yourself, sometimes you'll you'll just you yeah. idle, you know. What do, what do you feel like is a is a really um, memorable example in in your career or recent history or working with David where limitation was the the real impetus and catalyst for creativity? Um, I think just in general, everything we like because we were a touring show, we couldn't rely on trap doors on stages. We couldn't rely on automation and you know built into the stage. Everything had to fit in a road case and into a truck. So you had to design everything around things that could be wheeled around things that were above, you know, everything we do is above the stage. Mm -hmm. Even if we don't have to, because we don't want, we want, don't want people to think that there's a trap door. So that's why everything is two feet, at least, at least two feet off the stage. Um, even if we don't need to mm. have it two feet off the stage. And I think that limitation, you know, traveling set up, um, presets, all that, you know, contributes to an illusion being more efficient and more, uh, and design more robust, you know? Mm, absolutely. Huh. Now we, we had a couple other questions come in. Uh, Phil and Johnny asked, uh, did you uh, win the photography contest that you entered in Vegas? Uh, I don't know yet. I submitted some photos and I'll know in about a month and it's, you know, it's just a, it's a local magazine. And they take submissions from local photographers, and it's just for fun. It's really so nothing, we'll, uh, we'll have an all access magic party if you win. How's that? <laughs> Come on, show show your work, and uh, yeah. and then we'll review it as uh, we'll some table tennis. We'll have some soup. It'll we'll be have soup, we'll have some soup and some bucatini al yeah. uh, Oh, of course. <laughs> what, what what kind of soup are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was going to be my question is, uh, what is the soup of, of choice? Soup of choice. Um, you know what? I'm not a big, I don't make a lot of soup. I thought that was the key ingredient today. <laughs> but, but the reason I mentioned soup earlier, because backstage, Chris has set up a nice tortilla soup station in our dressing room. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. when we're working and we don't have time to go out and eat, which is most of the time, we'll just have some soup and it's fantastic. So. So it's like That's, a chicken tortilla soup. Yeah, the chicken tortilla soup with like a side of tortillas, fresh avocados, uh, and whipped cream. Or not whipped cream. Uh, <laughs> whipped cream. That's a new soup. soup wow. whipped cream. Chris Kenner has soup. an interesting diet. Yeah, just a genre of soup you like. Yeah. yeah. How hot is the soup? <laughs> it is really hot. That soup. So yeah, it makes you get, it makes you get back to work faster. You got to cool it off with sour milk. cream. It's like oh, I got to get back to work. Um, and then <laughs> there is another question that came in from Lindsay. Lindsay's been full of them. Uh, who's your favorite Simpsons character or classic literature poet? <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> uh, I don't have an answer for that, honestly. 
Uh, well, then I think we should probably go to our most important question of the entire night. I've been waiting all night for this. You think so? I think so. Yes. I think we should be good for this. No, hold on. All right. Make sure I got my. If you if you think we're good for this, then yeah, then we're good. I think we're I think we're good. Right. We'll we'll all be right. good. We're, we'll be good. Yeah. Ready or not, here it comes. Lasagna. Lasagna. What's your favorite genre of lasagna? Meat. Lasagna. Veggie. Lasagna. Plain. Lasagna. Saucy. Lasagna. What's your favorite genre of lasagna? Keller. Lasagna. Cheese. Lasagna. Bolognese. Lasagna. Lasagna. Blaine. Houdini. What's yours? Now, now, Homer, before we get to that, before we get to that, I mean, it is the most important part of the entire show. But we did ask you a question just before we played the song. Um, and so who's your favorite Simpsons character? I'm, I don't know. Uh, Maybe Bart Simpson. Bart. Well, tonight we, uh, we, we have a very special guest. Uh -oh. uh, a lasagna consultant we brought on. The man. The myth. The legend. Chris. The man. The myth. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> I can't say it. All right. I'm out. <laughs> so I don't know how good my mic is here. You guys all have good fucking mics. Oh, mic. oh shit. You can swear. You it's can all right. Swear oh, okay, cool. Right. I didn't know if this was like. Yeah, I, get, I, I swear last time. I swear last time. Right? last thing because I said I'd never heard you swear before. And then you're like, I swear all the time. Oh, my God. So speak quick, quick swearing thing. So we, we curse a lot backstage just because we i don't know it's just what we do we sit in this i'm in our office so zoe my daughter is here and she was young and she says uh to me homer curses a lot and i didn't even think about it i'm like does he really because i kind of keep my i try to not curse around her so uh she's like i, I call him the cussing man he's the cursor the cussing man <laughs> so recently she had a book and she goes my teachers gave me this book and there's some there's at least one curse word per, per, per chapter. I wonder if Homer's read it. <laughs> <laughs> the cussing, yeah. uh, and Chris is usually not a lot. It's maybe one or two at the most for the hour oh, or two. It's not He's much. It's not much. You're not, it's not it's like just a couple slip out, right? Crazy cursing, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> you've, you've cursed throughout the show significantly less than Chris's episode. Oh, yeah. Oh, mine yeah. was, I was bad. Chris was a lot. No, but, I, um, I cursed too much. Yeah. It was funny though, because like I didn't, like I said, every time we chatted, I you barely swore. <laughs> You're like, I, I know, I just did, I just there. did uh, Sunday school with Penn, and mm -hmm. that was we are, you know, the two of us are pretty oh, yeah. cursy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I'm a lasagna consultant, I guess. The lasagna consultant has joined. Yeah. The show. Because I wanted to blend you guys together in a, a lasagna <laughs> blender package. <laughs> exactly. 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 That was, that was one of my favorite answers of all time. In case you guys in the comments are not sure what we're talking about, we're talking lasagna. Okay. So, <laughs> nice. So, Homer, the most important question of the night, and you told me you're ready for this. So, what <laughs> is your favorite genre of lasagna? Um, probably a bolognese. Bo bolognese. Bolognese. Yeah, oh, you didn't add the hand, you didn't lasagna. add the hand. Uh, Oh, you they're, like they're holding deck. It's, it's like I'm holding my deck. Like, so. oh, it's oh. like he's the Filipino, and it's yellow. <laughs> so, um, oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, I'll tell you something. I came up a recipe. I came up on my feed a few months ago that was fantastic. It was a cacio e pepe lasagna. So it didn't have any meat in it, but it had two different kinds of cheeses, had a, a roasted black pepper. And it was, and it it was uh, the recipe had it in single serving little uh, like uh, you'd have a French onion soup in. Yeah. So imagine serving those to people where, so the top is crusty and 
cheesy. So it was pretty amazing. That was a really amazing for a non-meat lasagna. It was a cacio, cacio e pepe lasagna, which is cheese and pepper in Italian. No. I uh, I would just like to point out um, that, that Homer is like this character from this college humor skit. I don't know if you've seen this sketch before, but uh, this guy. Uh, I've heard good things about the prosciutto. Uh, <laughs> that is 100%. Now, now, Chris, what's your take on, on Homer's uh, genre? Is it is it good or is it... I mean, lasagna, lasagna genre? Yeah, as a consultant, what do you think about it? You know, well, wait, wait, hold on. First off, we're, what was the question originally? The original question is just what a genre? That wasn't my original question, I don't think. Oh yeah, no. Oh, that's a, well, oh we do have a follow up oh, question. You know, follow -up okay, question. okay, okay. Follow up okay. question is what you uh, you. I think that's you know about. it's that's what I'm nuts about. I think that's <laughs> that's good. You know the, the the lasagna sounds good. I think he's actually described that to me before, as a uh, something mm. he wanted to make. So I am very well aware of the idea, and that sounds great. You get your own little single single serving of yeah. So you, get, you know, so every every serving has a crusty because the best part about lasagna is that crusty edge, right? Yeah, yeah, like your Tim Hortons mm. or something. <laughs> like you're at Tim Hortons or something. Yeah. Oh, the Canadian, yeah. A. It's all about the crusty a. edge of Tim yeah, Hortons. Yeah, hey, you betcha. Yeah. You guys should fly in Don't you know? Canadian Tim Hortons uh, coffee for you guys during the show. Oh, God. <laughs> um, now, that's good to hear that he's actually talked about it before because I know Homer has been, he's been studying up for this episode all week. And so, I uh, trust me. Yeah. Like, you know, I need I need to represent. That's right. That's, that's true. true. But uh, you know, I just want to make sure he wasn't like Google searching like genres of lasagna throughout the week. Because I didn't know. If, I didn't know if I did actual actually. lasagna genre. Oh shit! La lasagna, lasagna genres. genres. Yeah, I'm not a yeah. big lasagna fan because it just feels it's a it's a pretty heavy dish. Mm -hmm. Just stacks of pasta. It, Doug cheese. McKenzie told us that it is a winter dish, a winter not dish. a summer yeah. dish. Yeah. Like, said, hey, I think that's probably good good that's analogy. Yeah. It's it's also. Well, for me, I'm diabetic, so I really don't want to have pasta. So, and I just recently heard that um, bolognese, <laughs> bolognese, spaghetti bolognese was kind of a, a winter dish, also. It's a bolognese, bolognese, bolognese. How are we doing, yeah, Christian? Yeah, yeah. Is that right? I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure you're more right than we are. Shit. Cook. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, sure. will tell us. I Shit love how we just home. found out that our our Italian foods expert. The chef and our lasagna consultant both don't eat lasagna. Don't eat lasagna. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh. oh, no, no, no. I love oh, no, lasagna. Wait a I you put lasagna eat. in front of me, I'm eating it. But yeah. I'm not. Let me tell you, lasagna pasta is one of my favorite things in the world. I just mm. I just kind of try to stay away from it now for the past year, yeah. almost. Now, yeah. should we go on to the to the yes, the question oh, that this is the follow-up question. Upset. Yeah. He threw his chair, Homer. It got ugly. <laughs> it was, it was embarrassing for on all accounts. On every to everyone, yeah. especially me. Like Homer, you've been very good throughout the whole episode. But we'll yeah. see after this. We'll see. Okay. Yeah. So, so let's say that you bake a lasagna bolognese. <laughs> That's pretty good. And then you bake a second identical lasagna bolognese. I'm so turned on right now. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and then, and you then take, take it away. And then you take that second <laughs> bolognese <laughs> and place it on top of the first. Do you now have one lasagna bolognese or two? I believe you have one lasagna, but... If you look at the menu carefully, it may say serves two. Serves oh. two. Like when you go to a restaurant, yeah. you order the seafood tower. It this is you a order seafood tower it says answer. serves six. <laughs> Oh, wow. our consultant says that that's a snowflakey answer. That's a snowflakey <laughs> answer. What a snowflake you are, Homer. Uh, oh, uh, you're muted. Uh -oh. Who's muted? Homer muted. Homer's himself. muted right now. Uh, you gotta unmute yourself on the uh, on the stream yard. Yep, down at the bottom, right on your picture there. It says your mic says isn't on the bottom in the in the thing. Click on uh, settings at the bottom and then go to ah. Uh, there you go. There we go. Hello. 
Ah, but you are uh, no longer connected to your mic. If you go to settings, yeah, check what your mic source is. Oh so my weird. god, I'm uh, such a nerd here. I'm a non nerd. <laughs> oh, it's all right. No, now you just all sound right. like Chris. We're all yeah, about guess, now. Yeah. Mine is sound. Hey, I didn't have any. I'm at work. No, actually, it. Chris sounds way better than you. Yeah. Right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. How about now? Sound good? No, you still. So you got to go down to uh, settings at the bottom there, and the, uh, uh, and change your audio. Uh, Oh my God! I'm so sorry, everybody, for this. No this problem. Hey, Homer, okay. the Golden Knights lost. We're done. Did All they right. lose tonight? I I was talking to Homer about it this afternoon, and I said they're they they needed to win out the season. Um, yeah, and then the Dallas needed to lose, but now Dallas needed to lose everything. Basically, they could have. Yeah, I think they Dallas, got one point. I don't. I think they did. They lose tonight, but got a point because they were tied. Uh, then, I don't know. They just played last night, so I don't. Well, know they, played they played tonight too. They played the Avalanche, which are very good. Oh, okay. Team. Yeah, the Avalanche um, are, are going to be. Yeah, Avalanche we and Florida OT, are going to be scary. We were, yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. We went to OT and. Yeah. His uh, I mean, you guys had a, a tough time though too with uh, with injuries, Leonard being out yeah, and Leonard stuff. and Leonard being in is probably part of the problem. Chris, hey, that too as well. But uh, but I did I did see news today that Jack Eichel rolled his eyes when the fans gave support to your goalie last night, and uh, so. He's not a very good team player. I don't. I don't think you guys should. You know who is a very good team player? Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tiger. Best team player. Um, is my mic on now? Am I good? Yeah, you're yeah, all good. You yeah, sound now great. You're good. So wonderful. All right. So, so one or two Wunderbar. lasagna. So it's two. You think it's one lasagna for serving for two? Because you've yeah. changed the menu. Yeah. Yeah. You go you, like you order uh, a, a very diplomatic ch answer. Chateaubriand. <laughs> <laughs> at the uh, at a restaurant. Huh? Let me rephrase a question. So let's say that you have two lasagnas. You bake two lasagnas, and you name oh, one. It's in serious now. Put the glasses on. And you name one Blaze, and you name the other one Ryan. Mm. Now, Which when I you put one do. on top oh. of the other, I know it'll turn you on. But when Whoa. you put one on top of the other. <laughs> Uh, who's on top? Who's on yeah, top? Who's on top? Uh, first I'm off, bigger. First I'm off bigger. which one went on top? That's a, that's the first question. And the second question is: Is it still <laughs> one lasagna? With because you named them, now they're personal to you. They have some sort of personal. Yeah, but uh, as a unit, they're one. Moment chance is one. We are one. Uh, we are one podcast. Yeah, that's what we. Are. Yeah, we are two men, but one podcast. That's it. <laughs> I still would blend you guys together. <laughs> you blend this up? Yeah. Yeah. But get the best of both worlds. Right. Yeah, I blend yeah. it up and then I pour it on something else and Now, okay, so here's one thing. Like what if Here's here's an interesting, you know, little wrinkle in time. What if one of the lasagna was refrigerated? Just, random head appeared in the I, I was going to say Homer always saw was like your hair enter Chris's face. Yeah. It's was like, "Whoa, what is that?" And that was that was a girl's rehearsing was rehearsing right over here. Kim. Nice. Nice. And she has very similar hair to Homer. Hi, Kim. <laughs> she just walked out. Uh, <laughs> it's a, it's a Blyan or a Riaz. Or a Riaz. <laughs> yeah. Um, a what, okay, so, it's a Bliezenaise. It's, it's a Bliezenaise. A Bliezenaise. Yeah. <laughs> it's a Bliezenaise. <laughs> now, if, uh, if one of those lasagna was refrigerated and the other was not, it's straight out the oven and then you stacked them, Wow, now that's it'd this be, is seriously It'd still be one lasagna. It's like the McDLT. You know, one side was cold, one side's warm, but still one sandwich. What was the McDLT? The, yeah, the DLT. No. This is something what, only. Dick lettuce and tomato. What BL, the hell? Was, <laughs> was it <laughs> yeah, it was it was McDonald's <laughs> dick, a lettuce <laughs> and tomato. You just went totally rated R here, Homer. <laughs> like, wow. It went real south. <laughs> this looks south. okay. I'm pulling this up and it looks awful. <laughs> This yeah, the Mick DLT. Let me, oh, it was me, DLT, so I was right. Yeah, the Mick DLT, also known as Deluxe, was a cheeseburger that was served at McDonald's in a styrofoam container. All right, okay. If you're describing the container before the ingredients <laughs> yeah, before the of the sandwich, <laughs> this is going downhill. Um, <laughs> that was served at McDonald's in a styrofoam container that split between the meat and the vegetables and sauce. The tomato and lettuce were the selling points of this menu item. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? Uh, the item was yeah. discontinued off the menus in 1998 because its styrofoam packaging was particularly bad for the environment. What a cop out that that yeah. was the reason that they did it because it was because of the packaging, not because it was an awful concept. Yeah. 
Yeah. The, the concept of the crisp lettuce and the fresh tomato not getting soggy from the hot steaming meat. Oh, wow. You're really right. We found a way to keep the lettuce and tomato cool and the quarter pound of beef hot. The yep, Mick that DLT. Was so that was their they tagline. Put, they just put the cheese between, between the tomato. And the, like, yeah, McDonald's. Their, no their way, wait, wait, but their way to keep it cool was to just just separate the sandwich and yeah, they just <laughs> made the two pieces. Oh, oh wow. That's so a, it literally, but I, that's great logic. Were you guys actually. even born? Blaze, were you born in 95? No, oh, 99. 99 wow. and it wow. is my it is my birthday today so i am now oh, 23 oh wow and chris yeah, has I'm a very here. special uh, birthday surprise for you yes <laughs> 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 he's showing me his mick dlt i've been keeping this mick dlt in here before <laughs> 95 <laughs> Full of this seeds. Just became a different kind of podcast. <laughs> Feel warm on one side. <laughs> on one side, I think your circulation's got a problem. You're cold on the other half. Hey, it's getting old. Prostates, uh, you know, they change. Got... <laughs> Oh, uh, man, I I'm mean, there's so a reason. Not, <laughs> there's a reason that... Wait a minute, are they watching this for magic? Or are we just like... <laughs> not at all. Okay. No. Uh, there's a reason you carry it in a bag. <laughs> it's cooler. Uh, Chris is like, I got to shut the door so no one hears oh, this. No, shut, no, the, no. shut the door. Uh, oh, so, no. Chris, you're not at home right now? No, no, no. I'm What's work. your address? <laughs> really oh. magic after dark. <laughs> it was really magic after dark. Um, no, I'm at yeah. I'm at the theater. Ah, uh, at the theater. Gotcha. Yeah, and, I mean, uh, Chris literally is taking off work right now. Uh, yeah. uh, Chris messaged me, Homer. They were look. David's looking for you at work. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> back to, to the magic no, lab. I was, and was like, well, that was Homer. Well, well, no, Homer will get this. Homer will get this. So show ended, and it's kind of funny. You know, show ends, and you guys are right. I'm like, oh, it's going to work out perfect timing wise. And David comes in, and. He's he's like, uh, let's go over to the side room. <laughs> I think because you weren't here, maybe. Uh, so I went over to the side room with him. And I'm like, holy shit, I could be here till the show starts. So I might not be able to make this. So Homer would understand that. No, I just I just ran off to another location okay. with David as opposed to normally he would just hung out in here in my office. But he just uh, he just wanted to go chat, chat somewhere else. So, uh, Homer, today is your last day of work. Um, <laughs> we're really sorry you missed tonight. Chris brought him in, or Dave brought Chris into the side room, and that's it. Yeah, and I hate to tell it to you like this. It's all Chris's about... new chef making diabetic lasagna. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I matter if there's, there's got to be a diabetic lasagna, right? It'd be like, how, what would be, what would be the, the noodle or place? Like cauliflower or something? Yeah, something like that. Some low glycemic. Uh, yeah, something or, to keep or, the, or plant based. Something that won't turn into plant based for sure. Something that will yeah. not like zucchini or something that won't turn into sugar. Yeah. Mm. Quickly. Yeah, because yeah, I'm sure, there's, I bet, I'm sure there's a good recipe out there. Mm. So that's yeah. the next thing. You guys need to do a, a diabetic uh lasagna uh diabetic party. lasagna. We'll make it or either we'll make guys, it out of just straight zucchini layers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Blaze, are you coming to Magic Live? Absolutely. Oh, cool. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. So, so we, we're trying. We're trying to find a place right now to do our lasagna eating contest. Ooh, uh, yeah. And so, because uh, we want to film everything and make it look good, so we've. Uh, I Homer's talked, house. Yeah, there we go. I mean, well, I'm offering Homer's house. <laughs> Homer, we're we're excited for the the brisket <laughs> The blaze of lasagna. Blaze of lasagna. Blaze of lasagna. Yeah. Blaze of lasagna. Yeah. Blaze of lasagna. I'm just making shit. I'm so looking forward to it. <laughs> Would you say that there's anything... Uh, if you were to describe one thing about the work environment backstage um, compared to, say, any other shows that oh. might be in Vegas or anywhere else, is there anything, like, one thing in particular that you feel is there's nobody else that's that's doing this? It's, it's you know, that's very unique to the backstage oh. environment with... Uh, there's Dan's definitely show. things that we do I won't talk about that's that's 100% different. Mm. Um, not, not necessarily magic-wise, business-wise, for sure. Mm. Um, we handle things a little different. 
But um, I would say one of the things that we have backstage is uh, it sounds so cheesy to say, but like the friendship between me and David and Homer is great because we know each other. We've been through good and we've been through bad and we've been mm -hmm. through pain and we've been through happiness with all <clears throat> traveling on the road for, mm -hmm. you know, almost 30 years together, all of us. So it's, you get to know people and you get to know them on a very personal level. So you can't duplicate it at mm. all. And our skill sets all complement each other very well. Mm. So that's another thing that, uh, you know, we have a thing we do in Homer. I don't know if he mentioned this, but every single thing we do, everything, we call it Homerizing. Mm. So no matter what it is, if he wasn't involved. Now, it might it won't necessarily be on a business thing, um, but any anything to do artistically or anything for the show. Even if he wasn't involved from the beginning or didn't wasn't involved, always it's going to get his eyes because he's got this unbelievable talent of seeing something and going, what about this? Or this, that little, that light should come from this angle. Or mm. why is it lit like that? Or why, why don't you make it blue? You know, it could mm. be anything, you know, and uh, surprising how many times that, you know, he's just dead on on it. Uh, mm. So, and then we, and then through the, and if, and if any other process through on, on the way through that process of working on something that he, if he wasn't involved, which he's involved with 90% of it anyway, but you know, he'd still homerize it. A lot of it would be like Island stuff. You know, we were doing something for the Island or David's apartment and David's just doing it on his own. He's like, Oh, I'm going to buy this stuff. I'm going to buy these things. And it's be a great idea. And then he'll come in and talk to us about it. And we always just, you know, call it homerizing. You know, mm. cause it's, he always, always puts a great touch to it. Always. Uh -huh. So, and his, and that term didn't come from us. That term came cause I knew Homer when he was in industrial design school. Mm. So that, that term came from a friend of his, Dave Hilton and Dave Hilton designs supercars. He designed, mm. uh, designs cars and he's an incredible hand, great artist. He also broke his hand so bad that he, and he was an artist. He drew with his like right hand. Oh. And he broke his hand so bad, like all these pins and stuff. That he learned to write, draw with the other hand. Like wow. unbelievable guy. So he's the one that coined the phrase uh, "homerizing." Isn't that right, Hilton? Was it Hilton? I don't remember. <laughs> I think, well, I think Hilton is the one that Hilton's the one I've talked to about it because he said it. Mm. I knew the word "homerizing" before we worked here, like wow. before because well, Homer and I have known each other before we worked for David. So wow. So that that term has literally been around longer than Blaze has been alive. <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Yeah, we're going to keep bringing everything back to that. Let's just make that the main analogy. He's so uh, old today. Hey, uh, guys. Guys, I'm on a podcast. Could you just keep it out? Oh, the boss is talking. No, exactly. <laughs> so Fuck up. Yeah, wow. just so start, you just start swearing at them. Just start throwing <laughs> shit. So yeah. then how did you both end up on the on the the Copperfield team? Did one of you join prior to the other and bring the other along or did you happen to know each other beforehand and then well, you both somehow ended up No, well we knew each other beforehand very well. Um we were performing in Indiana at Illusions restaurant and I was say, you guys worked at Illusions together. Yeah, right? Homer would wow. come and basically stay with me at the at my my place there on the weekend. It started like he would come for like one or two days or a month or a week and then and then it became 3 days and 4 days and he just stayed there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but skipping school to do that. Basically. Yeah. Skipping school yeah. to do that. Wow. Yeah. And it was, a, uh, and I was performing, doing, you know, magic, doing fun stuff. It was fun. It was like the best, one of my favorite times of my life actually mm. was wow. being there. So I got, I, I kind of, David found me sort of long story. Mike cave. I'll try to keep it short. Mike cave. And he said, you should meet this guy, me. And he says to me, you should meet David. And I'm like, okay, cool. And Kevin, he said, show him this trick with the little baby tennis shoe and this trick with coins and show him some other rubber band thing. So he came to Indiana. I met David, showed him some stuff. We hit it off. We drove back to Illusions. And then Homer came and visited us there at night, that night. Um, and uh, we just chit-chatted. And I became friendly. Mean, I talked to David from the, that day, every day on the phone since. Wow. So – I became very good friends. And then Homer, I knew Homer would be great for the job. And I was kind of lonely, kind of. I just mean, you know, it's road's tough. So that'd be great to have Homer here. So an administrative assistant job came up, not a creative <laughs> job, nothing. And I knew Homer could do it because he can type fast. He's smart. He can write. He's just, you know, he's 
checks a lot of these boxes. So I knew if I could just get him in here, hmm. the rest would just happen. And that did happen. So I called him and he was at a, I was at a courthouse. They were on a, tr uh, the son of the black Panther leader was on trial <laughs> near wow. Indiana near Indianapolis, about 30 minutes outside. And Chris is like, can you get on a plane in a couple hours? <laughs> Wow. So I basically uh, came home, packed a bag, and flew to Rochester, New York, where the show was finishing. Stayed mm. there in a hotel. Oh, my God. Look at that. Oh, look at that. Mm. Ah. Oh, there you go. Yeah, that's, uh, that's us. That that's us. That illusions. Wow. You gave up your gang life. Uh, somehow made it out of, uh, out of court, and uh, yeah, you just told the judge like I've got to go somewhere. <laughs> Can I go to Rochester? Well, we were just we were just spectators. We had a yeah. friend that was a police officer, so we were just like, "Hey, mm. come down." So we just watched. Couldn't really and hear much. Everybody had illusions. Nice. So it's kind of uh, cool. Me. I can't. It's not focused, but ah, you get the idea. So yeah. that was a blast. We had such a great time. We'd play Homer and I would play tennis most every day and just, you know, talk about magic and do whatever and then fiddle mm. with tricks and work on stuff and then and write magazines and books. Yeah, write books and yeah, exactly. That was and that was when it was harder to do. It wasn't like now. Mm. Yep. Now you Chris, for, for, yeah, for illustrations two, we had to three minutes and I'm gonna for illustrations we had to take right. photos with a film camera, yeah. develop oh, yeah. them, put acetate on, trace them with a, a black ink pen, and then then Photocopy them for the type for the book publisher to publish them. Wow. It's a yeah, long that was, yeah, that that was crazy. it was an insane, insanely fun. It was a great time, man. We I mean, because you got to it was great because I to perfor performance wise, I, I miss performing a lot. Like I still like to do talks and I still like to go out and perform. And mm. but um yeah, I just I miss it. I miss it. Um mm. and I got I was lucky enough to get a chance to do it in David's show for years and then Eventually, I just was like, became, I sort of took over too much responsibility to still perform. I was like, mm, I had enough stress. I get it. Mm, yeah. And then I also wanted to, at the time, I was like, I'm not the kind of person that wants to do one at one thing his whole life. So I just was like, okay, I'm done with these tricks. They're great and fun for me and they fit me. So, you know, I just pass them on to basically the next generation of people. I gave mm. all my stuff to Nick Tafat and he just took it and ran with it like very well. Nice. Yeah. And it, it, you were you were talking about just the the kind of environment that the this tight knit team that you have that is so unique. And in the past, working behind the scenes with with Copperfield, you've had a, a larger team and the teams of different sizes. But it's kind of like this the same kind of core three now. <laughs> you know. You, yeah. You well, here with, I'll give you an example, okay. and this is no dis, no diss to anybody that was here. They're all incredible. Um, but. Here, I was always here before they were, and I always left before mm -hmm. they, after they did. Mm -hmm. Same with Homer. So <clears throat> that's a thing that you can't make, you can't build, you can't yeah. do. You know, yeah. and it's nothing, nothing against anyone that was here during that time that wanted to leave. It's, it, you know, after the show or come at the last second they could or make it about hours. We don't. It's not hours. Mm -hmm. I don't. Yeah. I don't know what hours are. I yeah. counted an hour in, in my life in here. Well, I, so, I think I asked that last time though too, is because I feel like, you know, maybe being older, I, I mean, I don't know if you both had any, I know Homer said he had a job before, uh, Chris, I don't know about you. I don't remember what your answer to that was, but I feel like a lot of magicians now, you know, made it big in magic <clears throat> kind of their entire life. So they've never worked a real like nine to five job. So like when all of a sudden at 25 years old or whatever, 30 years old, you're forced into that where it's like, you need to show up to work on time. It's like a to and, and have like a work schedule. It's so different where they're right. Work it's not the same. Right. It's, um, right. <laughs> you know, talking about like, the other guys, right? Yeah, like so. I mean, I worked landscaping for years, so I was laying interlock pads in like backyards and stuff, like doing heavy, hard work. You know, seven a.m. till till we got done. So sometimes it'd be seven or eight o'clock at night, and you you know, you just and you're up the next day doing it. But uh, you know, but I think a lot of guys <clears throat> because they're in magic right off the bat, and it's this. Magic is this glorified job where you're making absorbent amount of money for an hour of work or a couple hours of work. 
like, <clears throat> you know, I'll do a gig and make, you know, as much as my wife would make in a month. Right. And it's like, or a couple months. And it's like, <clears throat> when you tell someone that's been doing that, now you need to go to work and here's your salary or here's your hourly pay. It's almost off putting because they're like, Oh, I could make this if I just did a show. You know, and I feel like a lot of magicians have a hard time. So even during well, they COVID, have a hard time here. Just I, I, I must, I'll stop you. Yeah, yeah. Just in general, if what you said, just said, mm -hmm. and don't take this wrong, and don't take this personal, and anyone listening, I really just don't care. But yeah, if what you said was true, they'd all be rich. Mm -hmm. Oh, a hundred percent. But that's what so, I think. So what I'm saying is they're all fucking nuts to think that they shouldn't just go get a job. Some it, it, that mm -hmm. that job is not as that, it, that it's, it's down putting compared to going and making five or ten thousand dollars a gig or whatever thousand dollars a gig. Yep. Uh, it's if, if, if it was that easy, all these guys would be would be rich, be, be happy, yeah. be, be make it rolling in the dough. But unfortunately, you know, they might have that show, make that money for that month. And then not work. Yeah. Well, and working it's hard. It was hard. I mean, I, what it was, it's hard. It is not easy. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think one of the things you were getting at Chris was even outside of the whole idea of being thrust into like, Oh, now you've got these, these set hours is that the thing that set you and Homer apart in that context is the fact that, that you didn't care about that. You had a level of care for what you were trying work, to create work, for the yeah. work. And it was about just being able to make these ideas a reality and putting the work in to, you know, to I mean, the make the show of, happen. The amount of time, the amount of things that Homer has done at his house where he is, taken home stuff that's, you know, to paint or to create or to work on it's on the, for the Island or something. It's unbelievable. I mean, I could, could, you know, that's the dedication there is you can't mm. make it. I can't find it. Yeah. But yeah. I always have, a, I have a, I have a hard time when I, I have a really tough time with magicians when they start talking about how they make this much money doing gigs and they're living still hand to hand at mouth. And don't tell me you're making $3,000 a gig and then, or whatever. Well, and you can't feed your freaking family. The joke where what is the difference between a magician and a pizza? A pizza can feed a family of four. Uh, <laughs> it, you know, there's some truth to that. So, again, people are going to hate me for this, but that's okay. No, they hate me. No, that's it's 100%. You're saying true. it's just totally true. Because I, I hey, find look, that let me tell you, I, I, I do very well and uh, I work very hard. Mm -hmm. And I have always worked very hard my whole life on myself, on Stuff for David and Homer has the same ethic. Work ethic. I've hijacked your your podcast, but <laughs> yeah, sorry, Homer. Nah, he's got a time <laughs> limit, anyways. It's yeah, he's only got two. <laughs> but but that's a thing. Walk in here any fucking second. I uh, but I would say that too. Like, I think we saw that in the magic community during COVID because all of these magicians lost all their gigs, right? And so some people went, "I'm going to go get a full time job. I'm going to go get a, go to work." Uh, <laughs> that is the new illusion that they're working on. Uh, you saw it's been first. three yeah. years yeah. on that one. Is um, David coming over here? He is. But uh, but yeah, I think I think that's it is a really good thing that you said, Chris, uh, about uh, you know guys. Well, answer Blaze's question that. also about a uh, backstage in the shows. You know, David's the creator of the show, mm. coming mm. back to talk to us between shows, during shows, I mean, after the shows, you know, the head of Cirque du Soleil is not coming to the cast. Oh, yeah, we get we get absolute 100% yeah, hands um, on David. He, he David comes in and gives us uh, his feedback for whatever it is. Notes in the show, notes about, and that's unbelievable that David can do the show, give the notes, come back, fix the notes, do the next show, mm. come back, fix them. That's, it's a, it's a machine. That's it's a direct effect wow. on the next show. Wow. <laughs> you need me, David? Okay. See you guys. All right. Have a good <laughs> Great to see you, Chris. Thanks for hopping in. <laughs> Appreciate it. Well, that was fun. <clears throat> Sorry, Homer. Well, we had to do what we thought. <laughs> no, that's, but that's, that's our usual, like our dynamic. Yeah. I just, I like being in the shadows. I like, that's why a lot of people, you know, don't know me, you know, even don't even think I exist. You know, when, when Chris and I were writing his book back in the early nineties, Richard Kaufman, the publisher of the book, thought I was a pen name. He didn't think I existed. That's and that's true. Wow. Because usually I'm in sort of, I don't like, 
I'm usually in the background. People are talking, and be, and and Chris is likes to to present himself when he's in a group of people. I'm usually one step back. I'm always in the shadows, you mm. know. And that's kind of like been my personality always, anyway. So, mm. so Homer about the kite. Uh, when should we expect <laughs> to see that? The flying kite. Mm. Yeah. yeah, the new flying illusion. <laughs> Yeah, so so Copperfield shrinks down this big, and yeah. then he flies the kite. It's, actually, it's like it's actually, when David Blaine held the balloons, but like this big. But it will be a kite. No, it's um, it's an actually it's a clue in like a treasure hunt escape room kind of thing. So nice. it's just we needed we needed a small kite to fit in a jar. So that's uh, something they found, and uh, that's, that's all that is. Nothing nothing groundbreaking. Nice. That is very code wordish, I think. <laughs> um, Phil and Johnny, he's been in lots of questions. He says, uh, "How often do you guys fight?" Um, Are you like often. an old married couple? Not. We rarely fight. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, he he's like my big brother, so he'll just be like Homer. Uh, I let me give you a little uh, friendly advice from a. No, what is it? I'll give you a little advice from a friendly observer. Is what he mm. used to say. <laughs> mm. uh, you know, so he likes to look out for me, and uh, so and I and I understand that. So I'm I try never to, you know, I don't sh schmooze him per se, but I understand where he's coming from. So I'm I uh, I'm try not to be combative with him, even if I know mm. I'm you know I'm right on something, whatever. I try to be productive with it. So. Mm. so Here's a question is like, um, <clears throat> obviously we know that, and Chris mentioned as well, back in the day, you guys had a bunch of guys come into the magic lab and work. Uh, and I know that they took part in the show and had different roles in the show and stuff as well. But you guys have been kind of like a tight knit family, like you, Chris and David for such a long time. Was it a weird experience for other people to kind of join that space? Um, and it, <clears throat> like, I know, obviously you said that you two were always there first and always gone was that something that you guys talked about even back then where it's like um you know hey why we're still the guys still here uh am i mic working now yes yep. mic, so. okay it was all for it was, i was out for a second i missed the beginning of that question oh okay uh so i said like back in the day obviously you guys i said you you chris and david have been such a tight-knit family for so long when you brought in those other the new guys uh years ago was it a weird transitional period kind of where it was like, you know, this is kind of our thing and now we're letting the, this. No, kind of I think um, they're, they're, they're great guys. And I'm, you know, immediately David's like, let's do this. Let's do, you know, he, he loves resources. So having yeah. that much creative thinking surrounding him, it was, it was kind of inspiring. You know, that's mm -hmm. when we were working on a lot of the new show at the time. So you know, everyone had their skill sets. The Blake Voigts and the Kalins and the and the Dan Whites all had an amazing contribution from different angles. And mm -hmm. it's like, I welcome that. You know, I I like if if I don't know something, I I don't mind asking for help. You know, from people and 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 learning from other people. So, yeah, I, I thought yeah. it was pretty pretty seamless. Nice. Yeah, but now that it is a, a smaller team, do you feel like things are maybe more efficient when you're able to just kind of like, you, you know, the direct kind of chain of, you know, idea and then going either based on your skill set or Chris's skill set and then, you know, going to implement things? Um, I'm not sure about that. It's... um. I don't know. I just concentrate on what I'm doing, and uh, I, yeah, it's hard. To, I, it'd be hard to answer that. Mm, gotcha. <clears throat> now, Homer, here's the real question: Is who really is the brains behind the operation? Is it you or Chris? <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm just messing. Up. Now that he's gone, what's we your both other? have our we both <laughs> have our input. You know, like that was said, a, he that was a snowflake answer. That was a yes, snowflake. That answer. was snowflake. <laughs> yeah, snowflake yeah. Be many. <laughs> no, I mean, like Chris has, Chris is an amazing problem solver. And, mm -hmm. you know, while I may be working on like, you know, the staging of like a new illusion for he, Chris will be solving some serious problems of like, 
why the show couldn't even happen that night because mm. this happened. Yeah. Like he he can solve these incredible technical things. And we have different inputs. You know, if I'm working, let's say when we're working on a new illusion, I normally play David. I'm I'm David mm. Standen. And mm. I try to get the illusion to a certain level so that I can show David, hey, look, this is what we're doing with the crew. This is what the illusion looks like. And I can maybe do that for 40 hours in, among two weeks. And Chris can walk in and one sentence go, well, why are we not doing this? And it's like, holy shit, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. And that's, you know, we all have our ways of contributing and it, it worked out really well, I think. Nice. Yes. Wow. Do you, do you guys ever, is there anyone on the team that's like outside of magic that's like not a magician that looks at the illusions and stuff like that? Because I know a lot of times, like as magicians, we look at things very particularly and sometimes don't see what what an audience member would see. So is there anybody that watches your stuff that is like knows nothing about magic? Well, anything we do, we'll test, you know, we'll even like try it on the people, the meet and greet, or we'll hold an audience, you know, section the audience back and we'll try a part of a new illusion. Um you know, we have a couple guys that, you know, we have a guy that's just a wizard of electronics and making stuff by, you know, taking the used license plates from the show and bending them into a gimmick, you know, <laughs> to try something, uh, you know, immediately. So, yeah, and he's not a magician, but mm. he looks at things as like we need everything to me. It's not a magic trick. It's like we're trying to make something happen. It's like mm. a, a movie special effect it has to happen. And how do you do, how do you make it happen practically? Mm. That's why we do like practical solutions. Not, we don't like electronic. We hate wireless stuff. You know, we just, we just added two Bluetooth speakers to our meet and greet. So there's music playing in the hallway. We can't even get that to work <laughs> consistently. Just, the, <laughs> it's just rid ridiculous how uh, some things just, fail unless they're literally a real, a real string that you can pull and mm. feel it, you know, tangible yeah. items. So we try to be as uh, hands-on as we can and as wireless or as wired as we can. So. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Hmm. I had a question and it completely just left my mind as okay. you were saying that, but the, there's yeah, a quick, there's question here that. from Bryce. Uh, he says, what are the relationships like between you, Homer, and other big names in magic, Blaine, Angel, Penn and Teller, Darren Brown, etc." So, yeah, I, um, like I said, I'm, I do my own thing. Mm -hmm. I rarely hang out magicians ex except for, a, 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 you know, just a few I know. And, um, like, I don't even know if uh, Blaine knows who I am. I'm always sort of one step away in the shadows. I'm always kind of when Dave or Chris are talking to these people, I'm usually one step behind. I've never met Darren Brown. Um, I've never actually seen a show, which I'd love to someday. Um, um, yeah, so I'm just sort of that person in the so shadows. I mean, it's just like, who is this guy that always follows you, David? <laughs> like, who is this guy over here? I'm, I'm sure they yeah. all know who you are, Homer. Mm, yeah. uh, I mean, you freaking had your hand in everything that David's done mm. over the last number of generations so mm. and do you prefer it that way are you more comfortable like not necessarily being the center of attention just yeah. like allowing your work yeah. to be seen i think it's just been my personality for years i've mm. always been just like even if i go to a party i'm sort of in the back i like w kind of watching everything unfold i don't like being in the middle mm. i don't it's just a, you know I don't know if that's what that means psychologically. I'm just so scared of, <laughs> you know, confrontation or whatever. I don't know the reasons for it, but I'm usually, you know, a lot of people don't, you know, people don't remember me because I don't, I'm, I'm not good at introducing myself to people I don't know. Mm. So I'm usually just mm. that guy in the background that, that people forget. So, yeah. you know, I'm, it's fine. That's why well, I'm on the I'm going to bring some confrontation to you at Magic Live yes. <laughs> on the ping pong table. <laughs> Just saying. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Be awesome. I need uh, people to play. Blaze. I would love uh, to play. Yeah. Blaze stayed with me. Oh. Uh, <laughs> and let me tell you, Homer. 
I'm pretty good. I at was ping so pong. good at ping pong. I'm pretty good at ping pong, but Blaze is a master at ping pong. <laughs> like you talk about like I'm you know obviously a masse in in pool. You know it's a very hard hard shot. It has nothing on the shots that Blaze makes. Oh ping pong. man, it has. Oh, I was like, so good. Bend it like Blaze. Bend it so like Blaze. It may be a new good. movie. Maybe a new movie. We I'm excited for you to see me play. No, I uh, I think that I am good at ping pong in that I boost the egos of everyone around me. You know, oh, like, yeah. I make everyone feel so good because they're playing with me, right? Like, you know, like they, they Homer, if you ever that's, that's lose, a, if you ever lose a game to someone else, like just play Blaze after. <laughs> yeah, and, and you'll, you'll feel so um, good. Like totally humbled, you'll feel great afterwards. It's like. A breath of fresh air. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm looking forward to playing ping pong. Uh, be fun. I just do it for the fun of it. I am no good. Right in your day. I just oh. started playing. Oh, good. Ago. Okay. So I, yeah. So it was the first time that I had played in a very, very long time <laughs> when I played and be, Ryan. And before I and got I my embarrassed table, myself so bad. <laughs> it was, it was, it was like watching a child learn to play ping pong for the first time. <laughs> It was like, I, I really had tennis, no idea what so I was I had doing. A little, I have a little head start because I was, used to play tennis. So yeah. I have a little bit of racket coordination. And then I, before I got my table tennis, I used to, I played a lot of VR tennis, which is amazing. Oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, that was, as actually Bryce's question was thought on VR place in magic or magic place in VR. I, I haven't thought about it yet. Hmm. Uh, maybe that's a new thing for David. There we go. The whole show is now VR. <laughs> That'd be all right. We, anyway, we, we sometimes take a balance of like, um, you know, there's a lot of technology out there, but, you know, when we do magic, we like to make it look technology less. Yeah. So mm. the less we, that's why we like everything looking so analog, you know, mm -hmm. the less, mm. you know, it's, it's, because people can just assume that something's a projection or something is a whatever. So, you know, I think David's magic's been and, and still strong because it's there's a phys, it's phys, it's done physically. Mm. It's not done with technology. Well, that that was yeah. the thing that we forgot to ask uh, Chris about while he was on is if we could see the blue costume. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I forgot all about that. Uh, that would have been great. It would have been. I just scro I just scrolled through your Instagram and saw the the table tennis thing, and now this looks actually like very serious. Like, oh no, yeah, I'm gonna <laughs> get destroyed. It's gonna be really bad. Now, um, Homer serves. Are you tossing like up like six inches? Yeah, yeah. I know the. I, I learned the rules. So yeah, I, yeah a minimum six inches, not forward or back. Yeah. On the table. Oh my no, serve, my serve's <laughs> okay. I, yeah, I, it's okay. I'm learning. Yeah, nice. That's that's where I'm at. I'm learning, you know, and I, I will. It's learn. fun. What yeah. is it like? Here's, here's a different question. Um, what is it like being in a relationship with someone who is also in the magic space? Um, it's it's amazing, but she has yet to do a trick for me, which is really wow. <laughs> that which is highly respected because, you know, the last thing you want is someone that's constantly doing, you know, whatever skill they're good at, right? It's like constantly. I haven't seen a single, the best, well, no, actually the best trick she's done is she has similar handwriting to me. Mm -hmm. so, I remember you talking about this. So like a few, like a month ago, I'm, I have a grocery list on my counter. I don't care, eggs, milk, and what is this? I couldn't figure it out. And I even posted it on Facebook. I'm like, what did I write? Was I, was I, was I drunk? Was I why did I write this and what is it? I couldn't figure it out. And then I, I didn't know that it was Kat that wrote it on my notepad because she has similar handwriting to me. Wow. So that's like the best magic trick ever. Well, you got to be careful. There's some devious things that can be done with that. <laughs> yeah. that. That's an interesting question though, because like I remember talking to Bill Abbott about that. Uh, this is going back uh, maybe eight years. Uh, I was a, uh, chatting with someone that was in the magic community. And I was like, oh, this would be interesting to, to date someone that's a magician as well. And he was like, no, steer clear of it. 
And I'm like, why? And he's like, well, because what you do is super impressive. Uh, so, you know, like his, his wife, I know, and he's like, I can go and show my wife a magic trick and she's blown away and it, and it's really awesome. But if they know everything about magic and you show them something, it's like, oh, well, double lift or whatever. Right. And it's like, it's unimpressive to them. So there's no way to impress them, uh, with, with the skill that you've been working on. So, uh, I thought that was kind of interesting. And then, uh, so my wife, when we met the first date we went on, she said, um, never tell me how you do anything. Uh, she goes, no matter what, don't tell me how it's done. And so to this day, uh, anytime she asks like how that's done, I say, nope, you told me not to tell you. So uh, she knows maybe that's a couple of things that she's seen backstage or something, or, or another magician has been in the room talking and she's overheard something and been like, but she'll get upset. She'll me like, just uh, exposing everything yeah. just overtly. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I yell at some of my buddies. I'm like, stop talking. She knows nothing. <laughs> like, uh, because I, I want her to enjoy it as well. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. I remember when but I used to hang out with everything Chris, was Chris already Korn. ruined for Kat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Going into it. What were we going to say? When I used to hang out with Chris Korn back in college, my college days, you know, I would go, hey, hand me the shell. And he'd be like, shh, shh, the, my girlfriend's right here. I'm like, how secretive are you? It's like, yeah. he wanted to keep the mystery to even his closest girlfriends that that shells exist or invisible threat existed. Yeah. He was very adamant about that. And, you know, it kind of made me think, I guess I really, you know, it's important to keep, to keep the magic alive, as they say. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Homer, you've told us how four, three or four illusions have worked during the show. So, I mean, really? Have they slipped out already? Yeah. Come yeah. Back yeah. Next yeah. Week. Oh, you've, yeah. Uh, you've already <laughs> broke. I mean, you've already broken your NDA with, uh, with yeah. Copperfield. So you might yeah. as well just like let it all out at this yeah. point. There's a couple no, questions. Like, There's a couple of illusions he used to do. He doesn't do them anymore. So can you tell us how they were done? <laughs> um, it's funny. Uh, Lindsay said, uh, that's not true. I don't think our relationships should be based on trying constantly to impress, impressing each other. That's true as well. Yeah. But magic is a fun thing to impress people with, right? Like, Yeah, but I don't think, but I, the thing is, I'm, I don't use magic to impress people. Yeah. Mm. It's the one thing I, I stopped doing somewhere uh, after college, you know, everyone, I don't know everyone, but a lot of people go through the phase of like, you want to meet people in college, you, you do tricks and you become the life of the party. And I got to a point where I'm like, wait a minute, once you stop doing the magic, they stop talking to you. To talk, mm. They stop talking to you and they go away. Like, that's all they know you for. So I made it a point to never do magic first, to, they have mm. to like me as a person first, then magic can come if if it even comes as a kind of a bonus. But magic should never come first. I think you know people should yeah, know absolutely. you for who you are, and that and that's why I usually don't do magic first to people, or rarely do magic for people. But but you know, fortunately, I don't have to do magic for a living, so I can mm. just do it yep. when I feel like it. Yep. So true. yeah. Chris texted me and said, sorry for uh, hijacking the podcast and getting all heavy. Uh, so. No, it was great. I said, uh, I said, it yeah, Homer hates you and uh, he's very <laughs> pissed off now. <laughs> so, um, but, uh, but yeah, no, uh, I think, uh, yeah, I think it was a great, he, I told him that you were coming on and he's like, he was like, please let me come on as the uh, lasagna consultant. <laughs> Yeah, because so, I think that is great. And you also did Homer affirm, and I love how you set the rules that no matter if it's refrigerated or whatever, it's still always one lasagna, which does affirm our lasagna mathematics shirt, yes. our merch. So one plus one equals one, infinitely. Um, and does it does it keep going forever? I think it must, right? I think that was like Chris after his episode was like, I'm going to go talk to my uh, physics friends about this because I think he had an issue with like how many lasagnas added up is still one lasagna. Yeah. Like if they were doing a Guinness Book of World Records and they had the world's biggest lasagna, they obviously didn't bake that in one gigantic oven. They had to put together multiple lasagnas, but still the world's biggest single lasagna. 
See, that's a, that's a Homer is just, point. yeah. Gold Homer's nugget. Is, gold is, nugget. That, that is a gold nugget. I you like that. Yeah. <laughs> he's really into the show now. He's there dropping his own gold nugget. <laughs> yeah. He's just, he's like, guys, I just gave you another. That's one. like he's giving like, yourself a gold star in elementary yeah. school. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, like, teacher, gold <laughs> star me right now. A plus. Uh, that's, that's awesome. Uh, the, I like Albert said. This podcast heavy? When did this ever happen? When did this ever happen? Yeah. We, uh, we like to we like to get heavy and then come up for I would have liked to do the IQ test with you, Homer, but you've already seen all of Tom's episode, correct? So you Tom who? Uh, no, Tom no, Elderfield? He didn't watch. He watched uh, uh, Allen's. Oh. Uh, so, so he didn't he, see. Uh, no. You, I knew well, you watched. I'm, I'll fail an IQ test. I'm stupid. <laughs> I'm more of a visual person. So if you had, you know, those tests where you're like, this, this, this folded paper was made from these creases, you know, those kind mm. of tests. I probably yeah. would be better at that. Well, what about a, uh, a folded giraffe? What about it? Oh, oh. it's, uh, are you up for it, Ryan? I, I, I think so. Is this new? I haven't seen this one. Uh, that's why we were bringing it back. <laughs> it's that time. It's time for my favorite rhyme. It's time for the IQ test. Let's see if you're better than the rest. It's time for the IQ test. Let's see if you're better than the rest. Did your teachers call you smart? Or more of an epidemic brain fart? It's about time we see. Can you count? One, two, three. Let's see if the answers will agree. Can you count? One, two, three. That's an example so of limitations. When, so if you had only 10 seconds to do that jingle, it'd probably be much better. Oh, yeah, but... <laughs> it's not our, that's not our vibe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, what a diss. I, uh, you know, I think our, our goal is... Like our I goal is how uncomfortably right long that. can we make the jingles? <laughs> so now, Homer, when you count, you know, because it says at the end of the jingle, can you count one, two, three? When you count, do you count one, two, three? Or do you count one, two, three? I or believe you go uh, like one, finger. two, three. I think I do that. You go like one, this. Two, yeah. But then what what finger is six? Um well what rating is this podcast? <laughs> He's like, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's awesome. The eleventh finger. Yeah. Four or five. You go six. <laughs> I don't go, that's when I get confused. I don't go that far. I'm really yeah. bad at math. So <laughs> Okay, well good thing there's no math. There's in this no quiz. math. Oh, that he wasn't the test? No, no, that was not the oh, test. Oh, I thought that was oh shit. I thought I that was it. Because he was like, yes. <sighs> I'm really stressed out now. Question oh. one. Uh how do you put a giraffe into a refrigerator? Very carefully. Um with put a giraffe into a refrigerator. Yeah. Uh, by opening a door. That's a big. That's you a open big the door because there's nothing to assume that the refrigerator. You have to assume the refrigerator is big enough to hold a giraffe. There's nothing that says it can't be a giant, thirty foot tall refrigerator or a giant refrigerator refrigerator box. But to put it into, it, you have to open the door because otherwise, the refrigeration would be lost if they had didn't have a door. So, there's your answer. Mm. so then. Answer. Is there any anything else that happens after you open the door? You have to close the door. Well, you don't have to. You just put it into the refrigerator. Yeah. How do you put a giraffe into a refrigerator? You open the door and escort the giraffe in, and if he's polite or yeah, she's escort polite, him in. Wow. Well, well, you have to yeah. be. You have to be nice. Yeah. yeah very cordial. Wow. Okay. Uh, we won't, right. we don't want to show you the answer yet, so we'll just move on to question two. Move on to question okay. two. I like these though. This How is... do you put an elephant into a refrigerator? By, well, <sighs> Homer's pissed. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm, I'm, pissed off. I'm picturing these are like logic questions, you know, like parallel thinking questions. So, like parallel thinking puzzles. Um, how you put an elephant into the into a refrigerator? Um, the same way you put a giraffe in. You walk them in. Okay. You open the door. Interesting. 
All right. Okay. Um, Question three. The Lion King is hosting an animal conference. All the animals attend except one. Which animal does not attend? Uh, the one that's listening to the jingle. Because <laughs> it's still, still going. On. It's still going. Yeah. <laughs> it's mesmerized. It's hypnotized it. by the jingle. That's it. All right. All right, we don't, um, and no, no other answers that might not be based um, on specifically the podcast. <laughs> I'm really bad at this stuff, so uh, let's see. Uh, hang on, man. Are they related? These questions um, could be uh, as much as the you Lion believe. King yeah. is hosting an animal conference. I guess the uh, lion is hosting it, so he's uh, the one that doesn't. No, he's hosting it, so he's a he's there. I don't know. All right. If you were to guess, just throw out what uh, which animal is not attending the animal conference. Oh my God, <laughs> we should have asked Christie's as well to yeah. see who, <laughs> the one say, lurking in the wow. shadows. And then say to David making, after David, these just, are your problem solvers. <laughs> yeah, this is, not, this is not making for a problem. very good podcast. Um, <laughs> Lion King is hosting an. Animal. We never said our goal was to be good. Yeah, it's all right. Don't worry about it. <laughs> We're just here with you, Homer. Which animal doesn't attend? The one that doesn't attend. Mm, very <laughs> metaphysical. That was deep. Right. That's snowflakey. Yeah, that was snowflakey. That was very snowflakey. All right, and the final right. question is: There is a river you must cross. But it's inhabited by crocodiles. How do you solve the problem? Um, everybody must grab it. Does you just cross the bridge? Oh, there's oh, a bridge now. Bridge. Wow. Yeah. Oh. Doesn't say there isn't, so I just will take the bridge across. Okay. I mean, I mean, taking okay. a bridge. I mean, he's just taking a bridge. Yeah. I mean, you know, I I, I like. We can. I guess imaginary bridges can work into this, this equation i love this hang on these guys are the last <laughs> to show up and the first to leave no worries <laughs> no worries that's us baby uh so we're back to question one how do you put a giraffe into a river is there a frame of mind i can think can you give me a, a hint as the frame of mind i should be in are these logic puzzles? Oh, you have to like or... just clear your mind of all <laughs> thought yeah. process. I mean, I think There's I think that once you I think once you get the answer to like question one or two, you'll see you'll the see pattern. where. Okay, where, okay. so how you put a giraffe into... into a refrigerator. Your answer was. To well, wait, wait, wait. Oh, sorry. Is is this like a, a an, an anagram? Is like the word giraffe in refrigerator? No. Okay. No. Okay. Uh, wow. No, that 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 was good though. G I R A F. Oh, there's not in a second F. Yeah. Um, the answer is you were correct. Open the refrigerator, put the giraffe in, and close the door. This question okay. tests whether you're doing simple things in a complicated way. Yeah, like this. Uh, Albert says the property of being inside the refrigerator is hereditary. Uh, so take, take the elephant's mother, cremate it, and show that the ashes fit inside the refrigerator. Albert, that's way there, too difficult. There are no wrong answers. No wrong <laughs> answers, except for any answer that's not on this uh, quiz. Yeah, now, yeah. <laughs> how do you put an elephant into a refrigerator? Well, you were close, Homer, but... Uh... You were close, but you have to remember, there's a giraffe in there. So the wrong answer was open the refrigerator, put in the elephant, close the refrigerator. What you said, the correct answer is open the refrigerator, take out the giraffe, put in the elephant, and close the door. This I tests was going to say that, but then I thought, it doesn't say it's if it's the same refrigerator. It didn't it does say a refrigerator, not yeah. the refrigerator. Yeah, well, now, that's what I was assuming, an assumption, but... The Lion King is hosting an animal conference. All the animals attend except one. Which animal does not attend? The I guess a giraffe and the elephant because they're in. The, no, the elephant because it's in the refrigerator. Uh, okay. Yes, Daughter. correct, correct. This tests your memory. Got it. And that leads us to question four. There's oh, a oh, river shit. you must cross, but it is inhabited by crocodiles. How do you solve the problem? Um, all the crocodiles are at the conference. So it's clear, is that right? So yeah. you you don't have an imaginary bridge, right? No, 
You just swim straight across. You just across. swim across. You swim across. All the crocodiles except, are attending the animal yeah. conference. Except the one guy that overslept and is sitting there. <laughs> yeah. <all> the <laughs> no, your answers were um your answers were definitely more logical than Aussie's answers. Aussie Wynn yeah. said that you have to chop up the giraffe and Tetris the pieces. Yeah. And then you have to take the elephant and also Tetris them in with the giraffe pieces. And then he said what you do when you cross the, the river is that you grab handfuls of all of these giraffe and elephant pieces that have been in your fridge and you start throwing them to the crocodiles. Yeah, it's a creative right. exercise. Like I said, there's no wrong answers. Just yeah. embarrassing ones. That's <laughs> an embarrassing <laughs> one. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we have a we have a soundboard. I don't have it pulled up right now, but we have a soundboard where it's just like you Tetris the pieces. Yeah, <laughs> you Tetris the giraffe. <laughs> yeah. The blaze the of the crocodiles last to show still, up. Still sleeping in the river. The river. Hey, man. I'm gonna say that's true. That's gonna be a true answer. Blaze is always the last one to show up. I'm not cast. the last one to show up. So uh, I was here first. I was just I was just dealing with tech issues. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, most weeks. <laughs> most weeks. Yeah, true. Now I was thinking, uh, I was thinking about the uh, 20 questions and there's a couple mm -hmm. of things in there. Have you guys played with the magic puzzle that mm -hmm. um from Jordan and Simon Cornell? And uh, mm -hmm. no. so it's it, mm -hmm. they have this amazing puzzle company where it's like jigsaw puzzles with original art, incredible art. Every detail has a story, all kind of tells a story together. And once you are finished with that puzzle, something magical happens. Mm. And then you open a surprise package that completes the pu completes the mystery. Really cool. Oh, Highly wow. recommended. That's so cool. I just wanted That's really to uh, wow. give, them, give them a shout out. It's the Magic Puzzle Company. You yeah. can search them on um, Instagram. Yeah. It wow. Is yeah. A great application of magic principles to an, like an everyday um, pastime. So magic puzzle oh, company i think it's magic puzzle company.com i believe or maybe i'm on the wrong thing no <laughs> the magic puzzle company they're on instagram they're easy to find yeah, yeah. all right huh sweet fascinating yeah i think i've seen some of their stuff before but interesting yes right. six so jordan, out jordan gold and simon like, cornell yeah and then one other guy uh, i forgot his name but he uh developed uh, cards against humanity i think so oh, oh wow that's crazy yeah. Huh. So now, are there any particular um, projects that you're working on for yourself personally that are that are in the works or anything that you're excited about? You know, outside of the uh, the Copperfield sphere. Um, couple of small things, things that have been sort of in the works for a long time. I want to do another deck of cards. I, I was gonna pull up. I have deck one. Uh, I've got a couple of them, and then you brought out another edition of it uh, later on, right? Because they, yeah. I have the both. I've got the original and the other one, but uh, they are downstairs in the basement in my collection of cards that I have kept sealed. As so, they should be. Yeah. So I <laughs> maybe I'll bring one to Vegas with me. Uh, yeah, I'd love, yeah, I'd love to do a couple more designs. I'm just really picky, and this I, it's really hard. I'm very difficult getting started on things like this. Mm -hmm. I have to really. You gotta give me a deadline or I'm not starting. <laughs> so, mm. um, and uh, yeah, and just, uh, you know, busy at work, busy just trying to get on with life and uh, and uh, learning how to cook, so. Mm. Well, I was gonna ask that because uh, we talked about deadlines earlier as well, um, but it didn't seem like, like David really sets deadlines uh, because I mean, sometimes you guys are working on things for, you know, eight years. Uh, yeah. But there's a million deadlines in the between some, mm. and a lot of times it's like, Oh, work on that idea and show me after the show. That's your deadline. I've got oh, okay. an hour to, to come do something that might take two hours Yeah, or it might be an hour to do something where I don't know the answer. Mm. So I've got to wow. at least, you know, even if they're bad, here's three ideas based on, what you just uh, told me to do. So that's a deadline to me. And, you know, things aren't moving forward. You can kind of feel it. It's like, oh, we should, how, how can we make this, you know, there rarely do we abandon something and say, well, that's good enough. Let's go to something else. It's just like, yeah. we're like, attack it mm. until yeah. it gets to a certain point And then maybe we'll go, okay, uh, this, something will come up, sideswipe yeah. it. But yeah. It's always feels like there's deadlines. So, 
is that stressful to be uh to be constantly like under the pressure of like okay by the end of the show do this thing and you're like well it's it, that's a project that should take four hours but i guess i'll i'll give it something yeah. up yeah <laughs> like i said it's most stressful when there's no when i don't have the answer mm -hmm. because i feel like if i come up with 20 ideas but they're bad i haven't done my job you know what i mean so yeah. i try my best to give him an idea that he likes or an alternative idea you know yesterday right before the show he was like i need to work on this gimmick it's for the island but it's a, it's a gimmick so he can glimpse something and he's in the dark hmm. and so we were going to like have a backlit panel that with a secret thing that slid on the table so you could he could look down and glimpse and so he can miss call something and as i was thinking about that i'm like you know this backlight panel can fail he might not be able to see it and I and Chris looked at it, and within one sentence, he solved. He made it practical. Mm. He was like, "Well, why don't you just, uh, you know, let me uh, let let's say you're doing a book test, and you need to read a list of things, and you, you don't want to memorize it because you you're doing other things." So Chris says, "Just have like a like an extra menu that's from that from that dinner right there, and instead of shrimp scampi, it's the first word on the first page, and second word on mm. the second page, and." Mm. And you just look and it's right there. And it was like the greatest mm. solution that, you know, it's no electronics can fail. It's not Bluetooth that can fail. So, you know, that's again, how we work. So, yeah, wow. So is David still doing shows for the guests while he's at the Island? Um, he doesn't doing shows, but he loves, he loves creating guest experiences. Mm. Well, the guests can go to the Island and literally do nothing. Just, you know, sit in the sun, go snorkeling, or if they want, they can do a treasure hunt that we've created, or mm -hmm. they can uh, do an escape room that we created, or, you know, oh. they've created two new things, two experiences that are like really cool that um, the guests can experience without him there. So Dave is not part of it, but it's, yeah. but his presence is there mm -hmm. through, these, through these like uh, dinner activities. That's wow. cool. Wow. That's um, right. Now, like I know, uh, Chris said that usually when you guys go dark, you guys all head over to the island. Um, is I'm it, always dark. Yeah, <laughs> always dark in the shadows. You, you said it, not me. <laughs> no, uh, um, so, is that something that, like, you know, I obviously with the museum and stuff like that, David, is you guys are always working on that stuff. Is it something where there is like an end goal with the island uh, or is it like we're just gonna like the show we're just gonna continue to add things to it i believe it's always a work in progress it's yeah. always it's always inspired by you know i don't think there's no like we tr we've tried to do like whiteboards where this is the finish line yeah there's almost no finish line just a bunch of like peaks we keep hitting yeah so and uh a lot of it's just inspired moments where dave's like hey i want to do this on the island how do we do this well what if we take this and then we put our best brains to it whether it's just chris and i and david or maybe we'll ask um you know we have a couple people in a sh that work for us that are that have magic backgrounds you know stuart beck and dylan ace are both magicians so we'll ask them yeah. for input on some of this stuff and um and again that becomes your next little uh not quite an end goal but a project to complete and try because we have that's the best part of the island is just another audience to david and mm -hmm. to try new experiences mm -hmm. you know whether they want to or not you know if they don't want it they we don't do it yeah you know it's it's they're all electives so nice hmm. wow yeah it uh i mean that's it's still crazy. I was I was explaining to my neighbors mind. tonight that David has these islands and it's it's nine islands, right? Eleven it's islands. Eleven. Eleven islands. Wow. It's one louder. Yeah. That that's what my neighbor was saying. He said uh there's a name for that when there's a, a cluster of islands and uh, stuff. Arch arch archipelago. Ar 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 yeah. Archipelago. Thank you. Yeah. That's it. Alla Chiana. Yeah. I didn't an Italian accent. <laughs> <for you. laughs> Yeah, uh, 
Uh, so on the so is it one island that has basically everything or yeah, uh, it's, yeah. it's one it's one developed island that was a resort before David got there yeah mm. and you know a high end island it's like thirty five thousand dollars a day for twenty four people that's your basics mm. if you need yeah. masseuses and a tennis instructor uh, you know obviously more or, or or a special chef that you want to fly in obviously. So it's a very high end island, but um, it gave David the opportunity to be like, hey, what if we haunted one island? What if we did mm -hmm. a treasure hunt that went to this island? So wow. we, nice. you know, it just became another avenue of creativity for David. Yeah. That was, um, you know, it's interesting because, you know, it's really, you know, it is a luxurious island, but sometimes like just to get a hammer might take two hours because you have to, mm. if you're on another island, it's like yeah. a boat ride, it's going to the shed. There's, where are the tools? You know, it's locked. Oh, the manager's at lunch. It's just, it's crazy sometimes. So it's, it's difficult to get sometimes things done there because it is a resort, not a magic show, you know? Yeah. Mm. So yeah. It, correct me if I'm wrong though, too. Like, so if I said, Hey, I've got $35,000 or $70,000 and I want to go to the Island for two days, I can't correct. Like it is specific clientele. No, I, no. Yeah, anyone can, Oh really? I, always, I, 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 I believe anyone can book it. Yeah, you know, I you're you're you're, you're, bu you're buying time to be there. All right, well, that's a, well bucket list. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> and I, and I, there might be a minimum. I don't think most people go there for a day. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely, definitely. A, so a hundred grand for the weekend. Yeah, I think Basically. minimum three days people stay there. Yeah, sometimes as long as two weeks, you know. Yeah. And if they have mm -hmm. more than 24 people, I think one group had more than 24 people, so they brought in a yacht and those people stayed on a yacht. So that's the yeah, kind of money, well. kind of money we're talking about. It's not just yeah. $35,000, it's you're paying a lot extra for for extras, you know. Yeah. That's just the base, you know, just to yeah. be there. Nice. And, wow. and it's pretty amazing. So absolutely and so when when you say something like oh when we go dark on the show then we go to the islands is that you getting to use that time off as time off or is that just straight work time but now it's work it's on work time on the you're island. working on you're being you're creatively uh working on projects mm -hmm. yeah yeah just projects pertaining to the island rather to than the island it could be show. anything from like chris is really good with uh with electronics so he who will do creative stuff magically, but it'll also like figure out how to do all the lighting with a wireless Lutron system. So you can hit Euler flute cues and cue mm -hmm. lights in, yeah. in, wow. in one of the, mm. so, wow. or run music in, in one of the places. So he's really good at that yeah. stuff too. So it's, it's creative work, whether it's magic or just uh, the experience. Nice. Wow. Now I know, obviously you said like, for most people, like for the rest of the crew, when you guys go dark, you guys, that's their time off, right? Um, and I, I mean, obviously it looks like you're off tonight, but you're spending it with us. Yes. Um, but, uh, so we appreciate that because uh, I know you don't get too many, but like, what does that look like for you with like a day off? Uh, because I mean, you guys only go dark. It's like what, six weeks of the year or something like yeah. that. Um, I don't know. I'm really lazy. So it's, <laughs> I, try to, I just yeah. try to, I try to catch up on, uh, anything I need to do, you know, my, my dad's very elderly. So I, I take care of him and uh, mm. see him at least every other day. Um, I like to cook, uh, I'll probably do stuff in the backyard. I like working on the lighting in the backyard. I've got, um, I'll go play a lot of pool. I really should be doing projects. I should be working on, you know, I got a master class coming up. I got, I should be working on, nice. <laughs> um, nice. so it's, uh, yeah, I, I, I have a whole list of stuff like deck of cards, this thing, that thing. And it's just, uh, you know, mm. I need to get back into it. So, yeah. Um, I'm a big procrastinator, to be honest. So that's where you need the deadlines to, uh, yes, exactly. in. yeah, <laughs> I was going to, I was going to ask how you organize so many disparate creative projects all at the same time. And is it kind of just like whatever deadline is? I, I focus whatever David literally, it can change every day, it can change every show. David says, Oh, work on this. What are we working on today? Let's work on this. Mm -hmm. I'll work on that. And I'll put my heart into that. And sometimes it's tough when he, when I'm in the middle of figuring something out and he's like, mm -hmm. let's do this. Um, but I'm kind of, so I have to, you know, speak mm -hmm. up and be like, can I finish this first? 
because I don't want it halfway built or halfway designed. Let me finish this so it's like I can put it away and say, hey, we come back to it. And it's at least at a stage. Yeah. Mm. So that that changes all the time. Wow. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I was going to ask you one thing because I saw you were doing some stuff in your backyard with some like huge sheets that you were painting and stuff. Uh, what was that? I just um, saw it was some art direction for the island. We have a, I'm trying to think what what's public, but we have an experience on the island that that's like a, a, a an underground tunnel. That's part of an experience, wow. and part of the art direction. So it's just not, you know, I think it's limestone down there. So it's kind of white. It's kind of looks really cool. Yeah, we wanted to create make it a little more homey and a little more comfortable. So yeah, we created a cloth. A very complicated cloth system 10 years ago where the cloth is hanging and it was all bunched up into bolts, like giant, like two inch bolts in random places and it's kind of scrunched up like a backdrop. And over the years, that's completely deteriorated. So all that cloth is gone. Mm. So we had to redo the cloth. And when we designed that 10 years ago, I had another idea, which is a simpler idea. Instead of all this cloth bunched up, sewn, put into giant bolts, what if it was just like the sides of like a safari tent where it's just rolled up and tied off at different heights? So you get this like staggered mm -hmm. rolls of cloth. Easier to make, easier to sew, easier to install. And I showed it to him. And the first time I showed it to him 10 years ago, he's like, no, no, no let's just do this idea. When we were trying to redo it, we're trying to do it as efficiently as possible, not waste a lot of time. I showed him this 10-year-old idea, and it's like, oh, my God, that's perfect. So we did that. Cloth was sewn, and that was me aging the cloth to kind of, you know, how Disney will age something to feel like it's the Tower of Terror or it's, you know, Star Wars or whatever. Yeah. So that was just me uh, spray, you know, doing some uh, faux cloth finishing, basically. Nice. Mm -hmm. nice. Wow. It's like where'd you, where'd you gain that skill? Just picked it up along the just way. Along the way. Along the just way. Yeah. To, you, every time I every time I do it, I do it differently. I'm literally I don't know. I have no scenic art direction skills. I learned how to do that just doing it over time. Nice. Like I have no idea what I'm doing, but it looks older now. So <laughs> it looks older. So that's yeah. Good. He's got it across his stove. He's burning it slightly. Just spill some tea <laughs> some on it. Tea bags, yeah. Yeah. It's basically whatever makes it look good. So, oh, yeah. But I had so much cloth and I had like just a few days to do it. So I had to come up with a system. So I bought a, a cheap sprayer and I did a test and I knew that cloth of pig, you know, paint behaves a certain way when it's applied wet and then you add water to it it'll do things when it's dry it'll do something different so i knew that in my had that in my wheelhouse so when i was doing that i developed a system and then i was able to bang it out pretty quickly mm, and, nice. then, and that's that i did a reel on it so you could see that process mm -hmm. oh nice nice i'll check it out what of your various hobbies and interest passions would you say are you are you most passionate about uh would it be the photography videography is it you know is it magic um what is it that you most enjoy the you know of your different skill sets um i most enjoy cooking right now mm. because it just it's like it, it it's it's something you can do that really makes people happy i love mm. making something learning how to make something and then having a group of people try it and enjoy it. That is mm -hmm. very satisfying to me right now. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, literally yeah. every time I see your photos of what you've cooked, I'm like, dang. <laughs> I and, I tried, and I try to, uh, and because you know, I'm learning sort of on my own through YouTube videos, just like, you know, a newcomer to magic would go and just randomly go to different YouTube videos. I'm learning, I'm learning how to curate what I'm, watching and find recipes that fit me and understand that not every recipe fits me. Everyone says mm. this is authentic bolognese recipe, but there's 500 authentic recipes. Yeah. What, mm. you know, what do you like? But I'm starting to learn what works and wh why things taste certain. Ways. So I'm getting starting. I've hit a point now where I'm getting better because I'm understanding the process. Why do you cook something first? And then you add this later. Why do you cook this slowly and or not faster? Mm -hmm. I'm starting to learn that, and that's making a difference in my cooking just in the last six months. 
Well, we have your good friend, Mr. Chris Korn, with us. Ah. Uh, and Chris says, which one fits me? Which what? Uh, I guess, uh, which uh, authentic bolognese? <laughs> which says, one? what one fits me? I don't so, understand the question. I think because yeah, you were I saying that you need to find, uh, you know, the recipe that fits you. Uh, so he uh, wants to know which recipe fits yeah, us. Yeah, he said recipe. Something with a lot of greens in it. He's been eating so healthy and it's been very inspiring. He's kind of turned his, turned his health around by really focusing on eating very well and eating lots of greens and exercising. And it's been very inspiring. So so it would be a bolognese with a lot of vegetables. Nice. That does, that's not authentic, but hey, it would fit him. Lindsay says you got to cook it faster because you have a deadline. <laughs> yeah, that's what's most important. <laughs> that's the most important. How fast can I get this done? Uh, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, Chris, we'd love to have you on the show sometime as well. Yeah, uh, be right. yeah. Yeah, um, uh, and then I'll tell, you, I'll tell you one of the, the one of the most important things I learned in cooking that affects my magic or if, should affect the way you think about magic is. Mm. You know, I'm not a trained chef, so I didn't assume this. I didn't know this, but I started hearing. I was watching the some of the masterclass the, on on the masterclass mm -hmm. app. You've got Thomas Keller and Wolfgang Puck. They mm -hmm. always get to a point where, like, now you taste it. You know, and I didn't realize how important it was to taste your food at every stage. Mm -hmm. Don't just don't just go. Well, it says a cup of this and five grams of this, and it should be perfect. No, taste mm -hmm. it. Everything, oh, yeah. every salt is different. Every tomato is different. Taste it. Doesn't need this. Doesn't need that. And to me, that relates to magic. If you're just worried about the technique, I got a side steel. I got to put it on top. I got to palm it. Hmm. You're not tasting it because what is the audience experiencing? They're not hmm. experiencing moves. They shouldn't be experiencing moves. They should yeah. be experiencing an emotion, a story, some kind hmm. of communication. So that's the tasting. So make sure that when you're developing your magic, you're you are aware of what the audience is tasting at every step. Mm. It's that's, golden nugget. That, I, was that's gonna say, a, I was gonna say you didn't even know. need to say that it, was, but yeah, <laughs> that's a real mic drop moment. That was actually really oh, yeah, that's, that's a great one. Mm. Um and Homer, here's a question. If Chris yes, does come on, would you come on as a uh uh actually I've already said too much. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I've said too much. Um you might know what I'm talking about. Is, uh, that uh, Chris did earlier. Uh, yeah, was was yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about it later over ping pong. Yeah, we'll, uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, Actually, this I'm is more been... interested to play pool against you because uh, play pool a little bit more harder than. Uh, but let me ask you one last question before before we wrap up because um, we've already hit the three hour mark. Uh, Homer, uh, <laughs> we're both going to be in Las Vegas uh, in a couple weeks. Uh, obviously you're a fantastic, uh, chef. Uh, where do you recommend us going to eat in Las Vegas, uh, and playing billiards? Where do we go to do that? Right. There's, uh, uh, an award-winning billiard hall here, which is amazing called Griff's G R I F F S. They hold tournaments there. Mm. They've got tons of tables, beautiful lighting. So mm. to Griff's and it's pretty, uh, yeah, it's right. It's pretty close to, uh, the, I'm assuming the conventions at the Orleans. So the Orleans, yeah. yeah, you'll be just a yeah. couple miles away. Nice. And right. then food wise, I'd recommend a place called Sparrow and Wolf, which is in Chinatown, which is just mm. an amazing award winning restaurant. Um, nice. uh, me and Patrick lived not too far from Chinatown. So I've been all over, all over Chinatown yeah. down there. And that's amazing. Uh, yeah. Raku a, is a, have you been to Raku? Uh, I don't think so. Japanese, like, uh, you know, Robata style, or not, not just the Robata, but it's, unbelievable place pricey but amazing yeah. nice. um, i know we always we did a lot of thai or korean barbecue patrick loves korean barbecue so yeah and we, we went somewhere and, and like korean barbecue here what i learned from patrick is like the korean barbecue place by my place they bring your food and you cook it right then he's like no no no. at a good korean barbecue place they cook it for you and it's more like really <clears throat> Yeah, hmm, so, interesting. I always thought I thought that, that was, was part funny. of the experience was that that's you what I thought. Do but yourself, he, you know? he was saying it's more like hibachi where they they cook it for you. I didn't know that. Uh, so he says the good ones they'll do it for you. I've yet to go to a good one then I guess. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I said too. Yeah. But 
But so after a while, it gets really boring to cook your own food. It's fun at first, right. and it's like, yeah. all right, just just cook this shit. Well, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. By the end, too, the grill is so hot that everything just like burnt. It's like burnt. It's like yeah. uh, I don't want to yeah. eat this anymore. Yeah, exactly. So, huh. It's a different experience, I know, but uh, yeah, yeah, I'd rather have it just plated in front of me. Yeah. Out yeah. of all the time that I was living in Vegas, I, I've yet to uh, to. I don't think I've been to Chinatown in Vegas, uh, so I'll have to oh, explore it's great. that. There's the Golden I've been Tiki to Chinatown there in New York and, and L.A. and stuff, but yeah, yeah, it's uh, nice. It's getting developing very nicely. So wow. nice. Wow. I'll check it out. Well, this has been a blast. Thank you so much for coming on. Homer. Thank you so I much. I think we've had we've had a very fun conversation spanning yeah. deep topics <laughs> and and, of, uh, and and extra deep topics. <laughs> <laughs> but, we only uh, talk deep here. We know it's your night off, Homer. So we'll let you go. I mean, it was it's... my pleasure. I had a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody for your questions. Hope I answered a few. Oh, you've been you've been absolutely yeah. amazing. Great. Uh, We'll be back next week, uh, and then in two weeks, we're at Magic Live. So uh, we're going to make some big announcements in the next week. We've got some things going on for our patrons uh, and some things to become a patron uh, because at Magic Live, like we said, we're doing a lasagna eating contest. Uh, so we're trying to get as many patrons on as we can before that so that we can uh, we can make it as crazy as possible. So, uh, And like Chris said, at Homer's house. So... <laughs> <laughs> party uh, at homers yeah <laughs> uh, chris but, is just yeah. trying to throw his party at your house That's yeah it. exactly yeah. he's I just really can't hold as many people so. yeah <laughs> seven people limit uh, seven yeah, people seven limit people. we can we can That's, work with that that sounds you much you gotta more get speed. 12 bracelets uh to be in i've got a putting I have, I have a uh also a uh a five hole putting uh Oh, mini golf green. in my oh, backyard well, it's called i call it binary sunset links and you can search hashtag binary sunset links and you'll see uh, like a trailer it's a star wars inspired five oh. hole putting course in my backyard that's that's badass that's badass so binary that sunset or... links yes you, you okay. can pull up a picture i yeah, uh... I, made a post I made a poster a scorecard <laughs> that is amazing yeah, it'll be there's yep there's some of it there's the you click on that one on the right there's a scorecard Another one on the right the scorecard wow yep look at that this is a full on thing that pencils you gotta have your golf pencils you have the golf pencil and there's yep. the poster wow you see the post the vertical one is the poster nice wow the best mini golf course in the outer rim wow that's awesome so can we get a copy of the poster um I have only one extra I only printed oh. three. All right, that might, that might be uh, that might be some to uh, like the souvenir if you uh, if you get or a hole in one prize. There wow. you go, you get a poster. This is pretty awesome. Yeah, that wow. is a well, sick yeah, photo. That's, that's uh, yeah, thunder lightning over my uh, uh, putting green right there. So. Nice. Wow. Well, Homer, we're gonna go backstage. We're gonna. We're, I get a couple more questions for you to chat, but. Uh, we're going to kick everybody else out. So right. um, thanks to everybody thank guys. for watching. Thank you. It's been fun. We'll, uh, we'll see you guys all next week. Uh, stay tuned for lots of announcements coming yeah. up. Patrons, we'll see you for game night. You can join us yeah. at patreon.com slash all access magic. If you'd like to join us for game night and uh, we'll see you all real soon. Peace. Peace.